everybody a big hello hi i didn't go on this screen dr craig has also joined i think good morning good morning good evening for us <laughs> i don't see dr shanta Oh, hello. hello, hello, hello. I'm here, Lai. Hello, Mr. Brown. A very good evening to one and all of you for a very interesting two and a half hour session on some very relevant aspects of the Akuma to be discussed piecemeal today. We have the stalwarts on the expert panel to guide us through. We have with us, I don't see, Doctor, uh, our incoming president of AIOS, Dr. Barun Nayak, who has held prestigious posts in Maharashtra State Society. editor igo and then the honorary secretary airs president gsi besides being instrumental in conducting national and international conferences a teacher to many we have with us dr vijaya another very dynamic figure leading the glaucoma department of uh, medical research foundation chennai a revered clinician researcher who has mentored ophthalmologists noteworthy contributions to index journals and textbooks and has or has been honored with innumerable awards and has held prestigious national and international uh, posts of high repute we have with us dr ramakrishnan a very endearing and a very popular teacher who is advisor of tirunelveli branch of arvind eye care system again a major contributor to peer reviewed journals textbooks besides some exemplary awards and accolades and posts of great strength and standing at the national level we have with us dr craig chaya an internationally renowned glaucomatologist from university of utah salt lake city he practices anterior segment ophthalmology with a focus on the medical and surgical management of routine complex cataracts and glaucoma at john moren eye center university of utah salt lake city he is an assistant clinical professor and also a uh, uh, professor of visual sciences and has interestingly he has interest in international ophthalmology and has worked as a consultant and volunteer in the various uh, countries and his research in interest includes novel glaucoma surgical devices and international blindness prevention we have with us dr shushmita koshik who is a professor of ophthalmology at pgi chandigarh and she has held special interest in childhood glaucoma new diagnostic tools glaucoma surgery and angle closure she is a founder secretary of the indian pediatric glaucoma society vice president of chandigarh ophthal society and has held prestigious posts in gsi and more again an academician with major contributions publications and awards and accolades to be the very best amongst us we have with us dr tanush dada professor of rp center secretary international society of glaucoma surgery and on board of different world glaucoma associations chief editor journal of current glaucoma practice and has a pride of 300 and more index publications and a lot lot more we have with us our eminent lady dr chandrima paul honorary secretary gsi who brings in newer and fresher energy to an already very energized society she heads the glaucoma department of bbi foundation group of hospital and has had path breaking ventures into glaucoma for the country as a whole has a great presence in all the national international meets and has won innumerable accolades and awards i have with me dr murlidhar who is co moderating this session he is a senior consultant of cataract glaucoma and heads the pediatric and neuro ophthalmology departments of the i foundation group of hospitals based at coimbatore without wasting time we shall go on to our first eminent speaker dr tanush dada and he is going to be elaborating on something so very important for us again and again how to get the best of trabeculectomy while giving complications a miss on to you doctor thank you dr chitra is my uh, slides visible yes so good evening everybody so trabeculectomy remains the gold standard as a glaucoma surgery and that is primarily because it has the best iop lowering efficacy and the world glaucoma association recommends this as the procedure of choice for previously unoperated eyes but there is a inherent paradox in trabeculectomy surgery that is because if the inherent healing mechanism of the eye works then nature will heal the fistula and you can end up with scarring and blep failure 
on the other hand if you try to inhibit the fibrosis with mitomycin c you might end up with hypotony and infection so the critical issue in addition to the surgery is how to modulate wound healing to enhance success and reduce the risk of complications now if you see the long term outcome of tabectectomy it surpasses any other surgery you can see 90% survival with topical meds at a 20 year follow up so definitely tabectectomy is a long term solution for iop control and mind you this is without mitomycin c and you can see a decade of follow up with mitomycin c 0.2 mg per ml 75% of patients achieve target iop or less than 18 mm of mercury at 10 years follow up so definitely tabectectomy surgery remains the procedure of choice if you want a long term iop control but the question is how can we further improve the outcomes of tabectectomy the first important concept here to understand is you have to avoid high risk situations and the primary indication with you need to be emphasizing is the health of the conjunctiva so before you operate have a very nice check on the conjunctiva it should be freely mobile it should not be inflamed and that is perhaps the most important thing when you operate on a patient now if you have conditions such as blepharitis mebomitis nld blocks or contact lens users these are all high risk for predisposing to infection and you should not operate before these are treated in addition if you have conjunctival scarring due to previous surgery pseudophagia ocular surface disease diabetes these are all high risks for filtration failure that you must acknowledge before you go into the patients on the surgical table because most of the patients we are operating are on multi drug therapy and this causes inflammation on the conjunctiva it is very important to quieten the conjunctival inflammation you must use pre operative steroids and a course of fluoromethylone for 4 weeks can significantly enhance the success of glaucoma surgery so always pre treat the patient with a 2 to 4 weeks of topical steroids in the meantime you can give oral astaxolamide so that the conjunctiva does not have any inflammation when you are operating the patient the second important principle is you should try and avoid hooking the sphere reactors as a traction suture and this is because it is one of the risk factors in this uk trial for a failure of trabectectomy and in addition you can end up with ptosis so when you injure the sphere reactors you injure the muscle sheath and you can get fibroblast proliferation onto the trabectectomy site so better to avoid touching the sphere rectus when you are operating tabectectomy and if you are giving subconjunctival anesthesia always avoid the area of the bleb because if you inject the xylocaine into the area of the bleb and you get a hemorrhage that is itself is a risk factor for failure because that will lead to fibrosis and another very important concept is that tabectectomy actually is a misnomer because you are doing a keratectomy so always make a very anterior ostium into the clear cornea that will prevent a lot of complications so here you can see a fornix blaze flap i'm using a crescent blade so this is like a sich you make a lamellar ski flap it should be approximately 300 microns and then this is very important to identify the landmarks of surgery so here you see you have a clear cornea and then you have this transition zone of the limbus and then you have this white zone so this is the sclera this is the scleral spur this is the area of the angle and this is the clear cornea so if you want to be safe your entry should be into the clear cornea when you are doing tabectectomy and what i do is i put in a air bubble do a pre place suture and then make a entry into the air bubble so you are sure you are not hitting any intraocular structures then do your broad basal iridectomy and close the flap with multiple sutures now why you have to be careful this is a patient you can see that we are making the ostium after putting mitomycin c lamellar scleral flap has been created now at time of iridectomy see what happens 
there is a vitreous loss now this is a very important thing to understand that two issues one is you are slightly posterior so i told you always go anterior into the clear cornea and visualize the air bubble second thing is this traction suture so when you are making the ostium there should be no traction on the globe and this is especially this is the patient with congenital glaucoma already enlarged limbus and the zonular integrity may be compromised so because of a posterior ostium and a traction that led to a vitreous loss and of course this is a serious complication immediately you have to do a vitrectomy and manage this case and then close and furthermore how can you improve the outcomes especially in advanced cases which have a macular split always use a anterior chamber maintainer you don't want to lose the anterior chamber always try to use releasable sutures and if a patient has got a very advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy and you don't want hypotony you can inject sodium hyaluronate into the anterior chamber to prevent sudden loss of pressure so this is a patient of sturge weber syndrome where you know there is a high risk of a choroidal effusion you don't want to lose the anterior chamber so in such a situation after you have made the lamellar serial flap you should use a ac maintainer that maintains the ac throughout surgery and also when you have made the ostium you can titrate the flow and it also washes out the inflammatory mediator at the time of surgery and now you can see the ostium is being made and the anterior chamber maintainer is maintaining the glow and of course you titrate and you can also see amount of filtration by using the ac maintainer now one modification that i have introduced into my tabecchmi surgery is to make a deep scleral pocket and this is basically to create a intrascleral lake to prevent the fibrosis so this is a technique that we published as a innovation we called tabecchmi extra so everything is routine but you make a central crater so that you aqueous lake can occur so this is a limited deep sclerectomy the rest of the surgery remains same you are basically trying to make a small crater that will have an aqueous lake maintained so the basic purpose is in addition to your subconjunctival drainage you have a intrascleral drainage and also if you are deep enough you have some sub sub choroidal drainage also so this is a technique of tabecchmi combined with deep sclerectomy you should use only 0.2 mg of mitomycin c for primary surgery don't use 0.4 you can land up with complications and there is some evidence that intraskeletal application of mitomycin c in high risk cases in addition to subconjunctival can enhance the tabecchmi outcomes now there is often a controversy should we use anti vegf agents for routine tabecchmi not for new mass glaucoma the answer is no randomized control trials have shown there is no benefit of adding the anti vegf to tabecchmi it doesn't have any impact on the outcomes you can see this study the meta analysis the vasus map had no effect on the outcome of tabecchmi so don't use anti vegf the other controversial thing is the use of the ologen implants and we tried this for 5 years in rp center but the results of the ologen implant are not at all as good as using mitomycin c you can see success rate of 100% mitomycin c as compared to 50% with the ologen implants second study from singapore again very poor outcomes with ologen as compared to mitomycin c and they found actually there is fibrosis within the implant that is stopping the aqueous outflow and we also tried to use tabecchmi with mitomycin c augmented with the ologen implant just to see whether it was helpful but we found there was no benefit of adding ologen in fact the ologen group finally had a worse outcome you can see this ring of steel forming around the ologen implant so we have stopped using this in tabecchmi surgery and finally it is very important to prevent bleb complications because these patients are at long term risk for infection if you have a bleb leak blepharitis if you using punctal plugs especially juvenile and pigmentary glaucoma these patients are at higher risk of bleb related infection 
So whenever you get a bleb leak, it has to be immediately managed. Uh, for early bleb leak, you can use oral doxycycline. That is good for managing as a conservative therapy. But once the patient gets a late bleb leak, the only option is to replace the necrotic epithelium with a healthy conjunctival epithelium. And the very simple technique is just to excise the dysfunctional epithelium from the bleb and dissect the healthy conjunctiva around the area of the bleb and then just do an overlay. So you have removed the dysfunctional epithelium and just now you overlay with the healthy conjunctiva. So this is just an epithelial exchange and that can easily restore the integrity of the epithelial barrier. This is another patient, hypotony maculopathy post uh, trabecchiectomy due to a dysfunctional bleb mitomycin C induced damage. So here we are raising a lamellar scleral flap. So this is a lamellar scleral flap. This is Mominy's repair that has been raised and it will be reflected anteriorly to cover this necrotic sclera. So here you don't require any eye bank sclera. This is being rotated anteriorly. And then you make a rotational conjunctival flap from the side and cover the area of the conjunctival epithelial defect. So this is the autograft of the conjunctival lamellar scleral graft with the rotational flap. And you can see preoperatively the necrotic epithelium dysfunctional bleb and post-op very nicely the epithelial healthy conjunctival overlay with the Mormonese repair has been done. So take home messages, always do a preoperative check before trabecchiectomy, rule out any cause of failure, risk of infection, blepharitis, NLD blocks, always quieten the conjunctiva with preoperative topical steroid for two to four weeks. Never give a subconjunctival anesthesia in the area of the bleb. For primary surgery, use a lower dose of mitomycin C. Don't go above 0.2 milligram per ml for two to three minutes. High risk cases, try and use an AC maintainer or the sodium hyaluronate. Always close with adjustable or releasable suture. You can augment the results of tabexectomy by making a deep little pocket to house the aqueous lake. Give adequate post-operative steroids for at least 8 to 12 weeks. And if there is a late bleb leak, that has to be surgically managed with a conjunctival overlay. So trabecchiectomy is definitely a high yield surgery, but it has a high risk and you require a high maintenance. So do your best and then pray for the rest. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanuj. You so beautifully and extensively covered it all, but I'll still come up with some simple questions. Uh, I'm sure it'll help the audience. A uh, very basic question. How would you titrate the tightness of your flap sutures? So there, there are two ways. Basically, after you have put the two, two main sutures, you can inject fluid into the anterior chamber and put tripen blue dye on the serial flap. So that will give you an estimate of the amount of aqueous that is leaking. Now, if you are want to be, you're dealing with advanced glaucoma, then you don't want much flow, then you use a leasable suture at both ends. So in that situation, you will get very less flow. And post-operatively, you have to titrate by removing the leasable suture. And thirdly, you can use an AC maintainer like I showed you. And with a low flow, you can see how much of the fluid is coming out. And easy thing is to stain with typing blue and you can easily see the dilution and the flow of the aquas. Uh, Murli, you'll ask one question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, how do you uh, manage patients with severe uh, dry eyes and ocular surface disease? Can these patients be taken up uh, for trabeculectomy? No, I think if you have a severe ocular surface disease, then you are going to get a very adverse outcome with trabeculectomy and higher risk of failure, higher risk of infection. So I think you should move to a different surgical modality. If you have a severe ocular surface disease, blepharitis, mebomitis, the results are not going to be good. And long term, there is a risk of blebitis, endophthalmitis in these patients. Uh, another very basic question. You have a flat bleb. IOP is in the low teens and a deep AC with no leak on day one. So what would you uh, advise us all? So if there is a flat bleb on day one, and so there can be only 
the main reason is that you are not getting any blood formation either due to a leakage so you have to immediately do a serial test if the pressure is high that means your sutures are tight so either you have to remove a releasable suture if you have put or you have to use a laser suture lysis if you have not put a releasable suture and it is better always to put a releasable suture because sometimes you have hemorrhage or a thick tenons and then the laser suture lysis may not be easy and you can end up with more complications okay murli some more questions yeah sir if you uh, accidentally happen to button hold the conjunctiva uh, during like uh, for training surgeons if they accidentally button hold the conjunctiva while uh, pulling it down to suture what should you do no button hold you have to surgically manage you have to use ato vicryl round body needle to close the button hole because you have used mitomycin c and you that will lead to a post operative wound leakage and risk of infection hypotony so any button hole during surgery has to be tackled right away you have to close it with a pursing suture or direct suturing how would you manage or uh, prevent a disc a ccr after a, a trabeculectomy surgery so i think this is ccr primarily occurs more if you made limbus blaze flap in fornix blaze flap it is much less the main issue is that to use a mitomycin sponges or a diffuse area so that leads to a diffuse blab if you use a localized mitomycin see that leads to a blab with a great height and that leads to problem even if you get a, a very blab which is quite high there is a very simple technique uh, of paul palmberg to use compression sutures over the blab so that can flatten out the blab and you can tackle this uh, blab related issues uh, dr ramakrishnan i wanted to ask you a question we have done a transconjunctival suture during ac reformation after a trap surgery can we remove these sutures if the iop spikes happen or we uh, remain cautious about that Uh, actually, I don't have much experience with the transconjunctival uh, suture. Uh, what uh, normally I do is, uh, as Arun uh, pointed out, if there is any uh, blood uh, related, especially the over filtration, I used to put uh, uh, compression suture over the blood. Compression suture I used to. No, I asked. during ac reformation when you uh, passed a transconjunctival suture yeah so would you remove these sutures later or let them be no in such cases so i will keep them for some time suppose later on the everything is stable then if the patient complains of any uh, irritation or anything then i have to remove it. uh only some questions this is a very important topic uh, we then move on to other topics last question uh, sir regarding late hypotony if you have a large bleb uh, there is yeah. no leak and uh, there is a late hypotony uh, yeah. so how would you manage would you put uh, like uh, would you try to suture the scleral flap or uh, would you inject ologen into that area i mean or uh, autologous blood what uh, if you have late hypotony then that requires a full surgical management what you can do is if you have a asoct or a ubm you can see what is the level of the fault sometimes you have a scleral necrosis then you have to plan for a eye bank sclera if you don't have eye bank sclera you have to do a lamellar scleral flap or mommy's repair if the asoct shows that the sclerotic integrity is okay then you have to do a conjunctival repair there are two possibilities if your defect is small you can just do a overlay remove the epithelium and overlay the conjunctiva however if the the age is advanced and the area is very large then you have to do a graft from the inferior fornix or if the other eye is pl absent then you can take the conjunctiva from the fellow eye and do a autograft so these are the two ways of tack tackling late hypotony you have to do a full repair you can't do with autologous serum or amniotic membrane you have to do a conjunctival 
restoration with the healthy conjunctiva. Is there any role for a cyclodialysis augmented trabeculectomy in high risk cases? See, cyclodialysis actually we have tried and published also. It is something which is not standardized, and the cyclodialysis cleft often closes post operative due to inflammation, and you can get a hemorrhage. So I would not recommend that as a routine surgery to augment the success. I would recommend you that you can make a deep steril deep hysterectomy and create an aqueous lake. That is a technique which is easy and safer. Cyclodialysis may enhance, but it's not a safe technique, so not recommended as a routine for trauma surgery. Uh, have some of our expert panel also done this uh, sclerectomy uh, thing, which uh, Dr. Tanuj Dara so elegantly showed? Similar experience. No, we don't have any experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think we'll go on to our next speaker. We can always come thank back you. to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tanuj. Uh, wonderful answers. Our next speaker of repute and standing is Dr. P. Satyan, who's the director of Satyan Eye Care Hospital, well renowned and an extremely accomplished surgeon who's going to be dwelling on the nuts and the bolts of glaucoma drainage devices. We look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Satyan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra, and I hope you can uh, all see the slides. Yes. Okay. So basically, we have uh, three uh, glaucoma drainage devices, uh, out of which I'm going to just talk about uh, two of that. One is the Armat valve, and another one is on the audio tube. So it is important to understand that Ahmad was the one who introduced the concept of the GDD in 1969 because of the uh, failures, he improvised the device in 1973. And if you just look at all the current devices are uh, basically based on this concept by Maltino. So we have Ahmad, which has been introduced in 93 and the Babel was introduced in 1992. If you just look at these two glaucoma drainage devices, it works on two basic principles. One is, uh, with uh, uh, resistance, the other is with the variable resistance. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, when you're looking at the Ahmad glaucoma valve, they say the manufacturer claims at least it is a true valve, uh, but the valve uh, appeared not to close at the initial uh, opening in perfusion test at uh, physiological flow rates. Although we say, uh, when we say that this is one of the very safe glaucoma drainage devices, especially when you're looking at the incidence of uh, hypertony. So Armand glaucoma valve, uh, earlier the models were called as S2, S3. Now it is coming as a FP7 and FP8. The FP7 is basically used in pediatric glaucomas and FP8 in the adult eyes. But in some of the pediatric glaucomas, we do use the FP8 if the eyeball is a little bigger. So this is the arm of glaucoma valve with the uh, uh, size and the plate. Uh, when you're looking at the glaucoma drainage device with a variable uh, resistance, what we really mean is uh, there is a tissue opposition to limit the flow when there is a scar tissue formation occurs. So that's why we really don't have the uh, control like what the valve has because of the tissue there. So it remains unpredictable how much is the IOP lowering effect. The typical example for this is the Arolab aqueous drainage implant, which uh, the device is based basically on the barrel uh, implant. So there are uh, multiple indications where you can do the uh, glaucoma drainage devices after the angle surgery you can do or after the failed uh, filtration surgeries you can do. All of us typically we all do once the surgery goes for a failure only we take up these uh, glaucoma drainage devices but in some of the eyes where you have something like a secondary glaucoma such as uh, eye syndrome all these other syndromes or in some cases like uh, uh, neovascular glaucoma or uvat glaucoma or post pkp glaucomas probably this can be taken up as a, a primary uh, surgical choice so these are the multiple indications one can look at for the uh, glaucoma drainage devices. But uh, we have to understand there are uh, certain contraindications as well, like when you have a, a excessive scar tissue, the conjunctiva is too thin, or there is a pre-existing uh, scleral disease, or when you have a poor corneal endothelial cell function, though we do put it in the vitreous cavity or behind the 
uh, iris, but still when you have a poor corneal endothelial cell function, you have to be little cautious. There are some studies which is uh, uh, I'm mentioning about the role of uh, uh, mitomycin C, also the role of the uh, bevacizumab, 1.25 milligrams. Uh, both looks like giving a better results when you use it along with the GDD, that is 80% overall success with the bevacizumab uh, versus 90% with the MMC versus 60% uh, when you don't use anything. And of course, in pediatric eyes also, it gives a, a good long-term uh, effect. But the problem is, again, uh, the complication profiles uh, where everybody has. So when you're looking at the intraoperative, the first lesson, at least for me, is uh, uh, how much do uh, uh, I, I know how to do the glaucoma drainage device. Uh, my take-home message is uh, self-training by looking at the YouTube or uh, Dr. Google or by iTube is certainly not uh, a good idea to do. We have to have a, a, a good uh, surgeon who has done uh, many surgeries, who has gone through the complications. If he can teach you, then you can learn uh, better than uh, getting into the self-training mode. So uh, the other area is the post-operative period. Doing a valve or a tube is not that difficult. Of course, it is not that easy as well. But the post-operative period, when you're looking at the arm glaucoma valve, Typically, we have the first few weeks, that's up to three to four weeks is the, uh, the early hypertensive phase. Then you have the typically the hypertensive phase where the uh, blood looks much more inflamed with the dome shape and you can start seeing that there is a, a kind of an encysted uh, blood formation. That's, it may last over uh, four to six months as well. Then you have the stable phase where the IOPs may stay around uh, mid to high teens. This is a typical in uh, uh, AGB, you can see this how appears in the early hypotensive and then it goes into the stable phase. When you're looking at the audit tube, as we ligate the tube or there is a rip guard, then you may come across with the hypertensive phase for the first uh, six weeks or so. And then you have the stable phase or you may have some of the patients may go in for the hypertensive phase, which occurs typically beyond the six weeks time. When you're looking at the complications, uh, at least uh, for me, I have come across with every complication, uh, whatever I have mentioned, all these uh, 10 complications. Complications in tube is not very uncommon. So in a intra and post-operative hypertony, if you have, then just look at tight or snug limbal tunnel incisions, intraluminal stent if you are going to use a non-valve device, and the ligation of the tube with the 6O vehicle is uh, extremely important. Probably in some cases, we can inject the viscoelastics to leave there. So the, some of the complications I'll just share here. There's a tube behind the iris, but you can still see that cornea is uh, just gone in for a corneal decompensation with the hypertony, though the tube is just behind. But when you have a real hypertony with the long tube, definitely when the patient is rubbing the eye, they'll go in for the hypertony and also the corneal decompensation. You can see that early uh, corneal decompensation, you can see from the tube, you can see it is like a droplet uh, extending uh, superiorly from the tube and just enlarging it and then showing it to you. So this is how it appears. And typically this is the uh, corneal decompensation, how it has been seen early. This is another case where you can see that there is a corneal decompensation with the scar tissue formation. Uh, this happens when you have a long tube which is touching the cornea. Of course, the tubes can get uh, uh, migrated if it is long and it is very easy to move. And because of that, you can have the corneal uh, decompensation. You can have the tube obs obstructions with the vitreous, especially in uh, pseudopachics or opachics. You must make sure that when they have a vitreous, make sure that you do the vitrectomy properly. So this is another patient who has uh, vitreous just covering the front of the tube. And this is another one which has uh, iris getting into the tube. If you put it very close to the iris, you may get this uh, kind of a problems as well. This is another patient where you have the iris entering into the tube, blocking the tube. You may have the tube erosions like this. This is not a tube erosion. This is a corneal uh, uh, graft, partial thickness corneal graft. It appears more beautiful. And uh, the George, this is one of George's patients uh, whom I referred. Uh, he doesn't do the uh, any more uh, corneal grafts, but uh, I'm a little scared of just doing only the scleral tunnel, which may have the erosions over a period of time. And you just typically see here, there is a retraction of the conjunctiva, especially in younger ones, when you have the limbal exposure, 
then it is almost certain that these patients will have a kind of an endophthalmitis like picture. It is just a matter of time that they will get infected. This is another patient with a long tube. Still, the patient has not developed any problems, but we got to be careful. But when you have a failure with one tube, you may opt for another tube. You can see that uh, uh, you can see one is in the superior area and another is in the inferior area. Both the tubes are uh, longer. Uh, this is like uh, now it is 10 years now. The cornea is still better, so you can still go for it in case you are really comfortable in doing this kind of a surgeries. So outcomes and prognosis, all the both the tubes, Armat, as well as the RDA tube gives almost the same similar kind of a result in IOP controls. Probably the RDA has a slightly uh, edge over the IOP controls over a period of time, but many people prefer to have the Armat valve just because of its uh, ease of use. And uh, uh, after failed trabeclectomy, 82% of the experts would go for the glaucoma drainage devices in comparison to where you have done an uh, angle surgery, only 53% prefers to go for that. So this is the success rate around somewhere around 70% in most of the glaucoma drainage devices. So the recommendation is if you have an AGV that is Herman glaucoma valve, it is very easy to use. You can feel safer, but when you have an RD tube, the IOP control is slightly better. The Ahmad valve is recommended in patients where you have a opaque glaucomas or you have UAT glaucomas or you have a post-RD surgery glaucoma. These patients, I wouldn't go with the RD tube where the results are kind of unpredictable or even opaque glaucomas. So overall, both the tubes, both the glaucoma drainage devices gives a, a reasonable amount of good results. But what we need to understand is they have their own complications to understand. So thank you so much for your patient listening. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Satyan. You very beautifully covered all the relevant things which we need to know. But we'll just ask a few more tiny questions. Um, are inferior quadrants uh, better in silicon oil-induced glaucomas? Or is this benefit more theoretical than absolute? Uh, uh, certainly, yes. Uh, I would uh, rather definitely go with the slightly inferior areas. Uh, but if you have just removed the oil and you are certain that the oil is not there, then you can even attempt in the superior area also, not, a, not an issue. Only when you have not removed the oil and it stays there, then it gives a, uh, the tube gets blocked. How could you but tell us how to prepare? Do in the superior quadrants than doing it in the inferior quadrants. We have more of a, a diplopias and muscle injuries. How would you advise us to prepare the scleral graphs for our glaucoma drainage devices? Some standard precautions? Uh, you are talking about the scleral patch graft or which one you are talking about? The patch graft. The question on the scleral patch graft, if it is a scleral yeah. patch graft, I would go with the donor uh, scleral patch graft, half uh, thickness. Uh, that's how I most of the time I use. I don't uh, do like what Josh does with the tunneling and then keeping it inside. Uh, the only thing is when you make a, a tunnel, the tunnel has to be very snugly fit. There should not be any micro moments of the tube. That is where we have the problem of uh, touching the cornea, tube migrations. So we may feel a little uncomfortable to push the tube in the tight uh, fitting tunnel, but that's the best way how you can get the best results. If the tube moves, the micro moments, that's where you have all the tube erosions, uh, the still uh, erosions and the corneal touch, everything happens. Uh, Murli, some questions? Uh, sir, postoperatively, you uh, let's say two years postoperatively after a uh, glaucoma drainage device implantation, you find on the slit lamp, the tube is moving excessively. Uh, so what should you do, I mean? The scleral patch graft has absorbed and the tube is moving excessively. So what should uh, we do? Regarding the absorption of the scleral patch graft, I don't think it is going to happen. Uh, but if the tube excessively moves and then if you really see the corneal touch, uh, I, 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 most of the time I wouldn't do anything. Probably if the tube is too long, then I will just uh, trim the tube. That is one option I have. The other option is uh, just to take out the tube but closing this tube, uh, the tunnel is another uh, area where there is a lot of concern because it starts leaking more because it's, the tube has been there for a very long time. So it really makes a, a tunnel which will keep leaking. That is one real concern. 
or the other option is um, kind of a closure of the tube with the uh, uh, tying the tube, ligation of the tube is another option we have. Uh, but in general, if the tube is long, then it is better to trim the tube. That is the uh, first option, then uh, that's how I go. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Biji, I want in another area for uh, talking it is really very easy but uh, we all know how difficult to manipulate uh, removing it and then plugging the opening managing the hypertony putting it in another area is not that easy though there are some uh, good videos out there but that that's not uh, very easy to really do that uh, I, I think people also can share uh, their uh, Dr. Vijay, are you there? Okay. Um, probably she's not. Uh, I just thought I'll ask you one uh, one more question, Dr. Uh, Satyan. Um, how soon, I saw that case of yours, how soon would you actually consider doing a, a second glaucoma drainage device? Like what would be the time frame you would give where the first one has failed? What would you do in the interim? Okay. Uh... I have only four or five patients where I have done a couple of devices because we have tried out uh, uh, like a multiple, uh, at least two trabeclectomies, then one tube, then the cyclo, cyclo G, then uh, cyclodiode, everything has failed. And then medication also failed. Only these kind of patients where there is nothing much I can do, then I would just attempt for a second tube. Otherwise, I wouldn't go with the second tube at all because After what today or tomorrow, it's just a matter of time. These patients will go in for a corneal decompensation. Okay, Doctor Tanuj, you would have some uh, something to add? No, I think uh, I agree with Satyan. You know, if a foreign body in the eye is unpredictable. It causes progressive corneal endothelial loss. Once your GDD has failed. I would be really hesitant to put in a second GDT. I would do a limited cyclodestructive procedure. And if pressure is high, you can repeat the cyclodestructive procedure. You know, putting second or third glaucoma drainage device, first efficacy goes down and complications increase dramatically. So I think you have to give respect to the patient's eye. And I would be hesitant in doing second or third drainage implant. Sorry to interrupt you. This was before the psychology I'm talking about. Uh, yes, yes. Now I don't really do. This is uh, all I've done it uh, 10 years ago. Right? Yes. I was in, uh, and I've done that. But uh, all these last 10 years, I haven't done anything as a second procedure at all. What is the role of mitomycin C? We do know that the mitomycin C, uh, the equatorial fibroblasts are less responsive to it than the limbal fibroblasts. So, what is the effective role of mitomycin C in glaucoma drainage devices? So basically, when you do the armored glaucoma valve, many of us have come across with the uh, N-cysted blip, large N-cysted blips, then how you see with the trabeclectomies. Regular trabeclectomies, you might have uh, N-cysted blips, but that's not very big. But uh, typically, that happens in the armored glaucoma valve, not much with the body device. So when you want to really uh, lessen, I wouldn't say that we can completely prevent the fibrosis or the unsisted blood formation, but the mitomycin or the both the bevacizumab um, to help uh, to an extent that the success rate seems to be uh, reasonably better when you use the uh, mitomycin C. That's what the studies uh, suggest. Murli, then, you have a question? Dr. Craig, uh, any comments uh, thus far about the second GDD? Yes. So in prior, you know, and early in my career, I'm only just, just by way of disclosure, I'm only 10 years into my career. So I don't have extensive experience, but our general experience is that uh, we are putting in less second glaucoma drainage devices. Uh, what we're doing now is really, I think one of the keys of glaucoma drainage device is to use early aqueous suppression. Uh, that really helps to reduce the hypertensive phase. And it's a fairly aggressive protocol. Once we see the pressure rise above 10, we automatically start the first aqueous suppression. And that I think you will find that you will see far less hypertensive phases. Um, refractory hypertensive phases are difficult to deal with. And I think our current protocol is to do early 
cyclophotocoagulation. Now, this isn't a traditional cyclophotocoagulation technique where there's a lot of pops and destruction of ciliary tissue, uh, but kind of a low and slow technique uh, that has been advocated more recently by many uh, glaucoma practitioners. Abhi, it will go. Uh, um, one, one other thing that we also have been incorporating recently is just before closure of the, the peritomy is to apply triamcinolone about 0.5 mLs of triamcinolone uh, over the plate uh, before closure. And having the triamcinolone over the plate seems to also help reduce some of the hypertensive phase and encapsulation that occurs. Uh, there's a recent paper as well. I, I'll just put it in the chat box of the role of mitomycin, serial mitomycin injections in reducing the hypertensive phase. This is just new published or new research that hasn't not been published yet, but uh, is available online. So I'll put it in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Thanks a lot, Dr. Satyan. We have so many more questions. I hope we have time later to ask you. Uh, Dr. Craig Chaya will be our next speaker who's going to deliver the keynote address on the topic and update on uh, mix and its relevance in our practice. On to you, doctor. Okay, great. Just a moment to start from the beginning. Okay, well, I, I was gonna say good morning to all of you, but <laughs> it is quite early here still in Salt Lake City, Utah, but it's really a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I'm so grateful for the relationships I've made with some of you over the past several years. Uh, I look forward to the day when I'll be able to travel again and hopefully be able to be there in India uh, live. And so today, my the purpose of my talk is to really give you just a smattering update of all the different devices that are available and techniques that we have in the mix space. Uh, as you know, that this is a, a burgeoning field uh, that's still relatively new in its infancy. Um, I think many of us are excited about the opportunities that are available that we have for MIGS. Um, and I think as way, of, as way of moving into this, I have no financial disclosures, by the way, but I really wanted to give a tribute to my mentor. Many of you know, Dr. Alan Crandall recently passed away uh, almost four months ago and was a pillar in our institution at the Moran Eye Center. And one of the things that he told me as a fellow was that if you are doing the same thing you were doing last year, excuse me, if you're doing the same thing that you're doing last year, you're not really advancing the field. And that wasn't really to be critical of our history of glaucoma surgery and the things that work well. Uh, we've already mentioned some things that we've been doing for many years, such as trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices. But what his point was is to critically reevaluate yourself from year to year. And even trabeculectomy has room for improvement. And so I, I wanna just remember him and remember this fantastic lesson that he gave us in terms of really pushing our field forward. So a little bit about the history of MIGS. As you, many of you know, the term was coined in 2009 by Dr. Ike Ahmed of Toronto, Canada with these following five features that seem to be important. One, an ab internal approach. This is changing though, I will say, but early on in MIGS, it was thought to be an ab internal approach with minimal trauma to the surrounding tissue to disrupt the normal physiology of the eye. It should be safe, efficacious in terms of its IOP lowering and visual recovery should be rapid. So here's what we currently have in 2021 as all the different options that are available to us in the mix space. And as you can see, it is a large menu of options that we now currently have available. We have different otomy techniques that we'll go over. We have trabeculectomy bypass and scaffold devices. Viscodilation is a way of expanding Schlem's canal to try to recruit more areas as we know trabecular or conventional outflow pathway is a segmental pathway. We don't get continuous flow throughout the entire Schlem's canal. So by viscodilating the canal, we may be able to recruit 
more areas to help with conventional outflow. We have subconjunctival stents. We also have cyclobladive procedures. And finally, supracroidal shunts uh, we'll discuss briefly as well. So let me go over the first uh, different array of techniques that we have available. And these are the different otomy techniques. And I like to categorize these as both non-excisional as well as excisional techniques. The non-excisional techniques have been recently popularized by Dr. Fellman and Dr. Grover from Dallas, Texas with the GAT technique known as gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. Now we have been doing trabeculotomies for years, for decades in the history of glaucoma, but it wasn't until Dr. Grover and Dr. Feldman showed us that we could do this ab internal approach and really spare the conjunctival tissue for further glaucoma drainage surgery. We now have the Omni device. The Omni device is used to essentially enhance the outflow as well as to create an excision through the trabecular meshwork. Uh, this is a device that has a snare or catheter that allows this catheter to dilate the canal on its removal. And then the device can be rolled out again in order to create a trabeculotomy for either 180 degrees or 360 degrees. Now, in terms of excisional techniques, we have several. The first one that was ever FDA approved in this country was the trabectome. Trabectome uses an electrocautery unit in order to ablate the tissues. And this unit is right here. It's attached to an electrical surgical unit that has both irrigation and aspiration in order to remove the trabecular meshwork tissue. There's now been some iteration from Neomedics, the company that produces the trabectome, and that's this device right here which is the TRAPX device, which is very similar to the original trabectome in terms of its ability to also incorporate irrigation and aspiration, but uses a nice blade, dual blade technique similar to the Kahook dual blade in order to excise the trabecular meshwork. Many of you I think are familiar with the Kahook dual blade, which is this instrument here, in order to use um, a very polished instrument with a very delicate ramp in order to lift and excise the trabecular meshwork tissue. There is a technique that maybe some of you have heard about in meetings, but has not yet reached at least our country here in the United States, uh, but I believe is CE marked in Europe. And that is ELT, which is using an eczema laser on a probe in order to create otomy holes in the trabecular meshwork. So it's using that eczema laser to precisely create these bypass holes through the trabecular meshwork. Later, I'll go a little bit into the bang technique, which is a bent needle goniectomy technique, uh, which takes a 25 or 27 gauge needle to essentially create a dual blade style excisional tool. Now moving on to trabecular bypass scalpel devices, we have two main companies that are in this space, Glaucos and Ivantis. Istent was the original one that first was FDA approved in 2009 in this country. Uh, but we now have different iterations of the Istent that I'm showing you here. This one is the newest iteration of the Istent called the Istent W. And as you can see, it's a, again, a titanium device to bypass the trabecular meshwork. And it has a lumen of approximately 80 microns, uh, central inlet, as well as side, in, side outlets that uh, promote flow through the trabecular meshwork, which are each 50 microns, and there are four included inside of the eye stent. Now, what makes the eye stent inject or eye stent W different from the original eye stent is that now in the packaging comes two loaded eye stents on one device. The device is here. This is a trocar that's used to allow the devices to lay inside of the lumen of the injector. And now you can inject two eye stents at the time of surgery with one device. In the future, there'll be an eye stent infinite, which will essentially look like the eye stent W that I've shown you on this graph, but will now have three loaded eye stents on the same injector in order to deliver the devices over a broader area to recruit more areas of flow. The current device that we have that is a micro shunt as well as a scaffolding device is the Hydrus micro shunt pictured here made out of nitinol. 
Uh, the nitinol is a, a material that's been used in cardiac devices for uh, decades. And the company Ivantis has produced this device in order to not only bypass, but in order to scaffold approximately three clock hours of the trabecular meshwork, or I'm sorry, of Schlem's canal. So these are the two main companies that are producing the trabecular meshwork bypass and scaffold devices. Moving on to viscodilation, uh, the original viscodilation device was the iTrack catheter, uh, formerly um, owned by LX company, but now owned by Nova Eye. And this technique is known as canaloplasty. Originally, canaloplasty was designed to be an ab external procedure. One of the things that made it difficult for adoption, though, was a very meticulous dissection that was needed in order to access Schlem's canal ab external. But as innovation occurred, we now have the ability to perform canaloplasty ab internal. And that is using the iTrack catheter, which you see here. This is using a microcatheter that's attached to a lighted illumination system in order to discover where you are in that space in order to know whether you're going down the regular trabecular or conventional pathway through Schlem's canal, or if you may have hit some abnormal dysgenic tissue, or maybe you're heading into an aberrant channel, such as a collector channel. The Omni device, which I've recently or previously discussed with you, I wanted to mention again that the device is not only used to create a, an excisional or a non-excisional goniotomy, but it can also be used to viscodilate the canal as well. So the same device can be used for a dual purpose to viscodilate as well as to create a cleavage through the trabecular meshwork. In the future, there'll be a third company uh, known as Glaucos that, that makes the eye stent that will create an eye prime device, uh, which will be very similar in order to use viscoelastic to dilate. Moving on to our subconjunctival devices, there are two current devices that are currently available in the world. And one is the Zen gel stent pictured here, which is a six millimeter porcine gelatin stent that is used to bypass the conventional flow pathway into the subconjunctival space. Originally, the company designed the Zen gel stent to be uh, delivered as a ab internal technique but many of us have found even better results or more predictable results with an ab and external technique and even with an open conjunctival ab external technique augmenting with mitomycin. Um, next is in terms of subconjunctival devices, we have the Preser flow, which is by Santen. And this is using a unique material known as sieves, which is a bioengineered material in order to create this device that has less tissue reaction. Uh, we're excited about this device. Um, there are some long-term studies from our colleagues Juan Baye in the Dominican Republic, who has a large four or five year follow-up of a large series of patients who have received the Preser flow device. The nice thing about the Preser flow device is it's in the space that we're familiar with in the subconjunctival space, using an ab external open conjunctival technique augmented with mitomycin in order to deliver this uh, micro shunt into the eye. The micro shunt has a 70 micron lumen and similar to the Zen gel stent, which has a 50 micron lumen based on flow dynamics by limiting the, the internal lumen, we're able to actually create some internal resistance to reduce some of the dreaded complications that we all have faced in our careers, such as a significant hypotony uh, and overfiltration after, tra after trabeculectomy surgery. Cycle ablative procedures have now really moved into the mix space as well. And we have several different ones that I want to categorize. One is the ECP, which is the endoscopic cytophotocoagulation probe. Uh, this is the probe that's used through an ab in internal technique that allows us to directly visualize the ciliary processes in order to treat them. I've categorized the micropulse cyclophotocoagulation technique also as a mix procedure because it's extremely gentle on the eye with very little inflammation. It's not the CPC of old uh, where there's significant uh, inflammation. Something new that will come down the pipeline later is the UC3 technique, uh, which is using the principles of ultrasound in order to maybe stimulate cytokine, per, um, cytokine modulation and in order to uh, modulate the trabecular meshwork pathway. It's essentially, we all know that there is some effect to uh, fa fecal emulsification 
in terms of IOP lowering. And some of us believe that it may be related simply due to the ultrasound energy. Uh, and it may actually create a, a modulation similar to what we find with uh, laser trabeculoplasty. So this is using a unit that's applied, that applies circumferential ultrasound energy to the perilimbal region. The final category is suprachoroidal shunts. So the SIPAS unit was the first one that was FDA approved here in the United States, but unfortunately was withdrawn a few years ago because of concern of endothelial cell compromise. So because of that, the device was taken off the market. Istent Supra was also recently withdrawn from R&D. Not necessarily, it never entered the market here in the United States, but was in clinical trials. Uh, and I think because of concerns with SIPAS, the company Glaucos has decided to withdraw their efforts to bring it to the market. Uh, a couple of other devices that may help us in the future with suprachoroidal drainage in a more predictable fashion is the MiniJEC and the Starflow, both by iStar Medical. Here you can see the MiniJEC. The MiniJEC is a silicone, medical grade silicone shunt that's applied through an ab internal approach into the suprachoroidal space. This is the Starflow device. In contrast to the MiniJEC, the Starflow device is applied or implanted through an ab external technique under a scleral flap. While not in the typical category of MIGs, there's something that I want you guys all to understand about the future. We all know that blood surgery can be difficult to deal with. It has its challenges, as we've mentioned from our prior speaker, that it can be high maintenance. Uh, what if there was a way that we could actually filter aqueous without blebs? And this is a potential future option, and it's through transcorneal filtration. This is the Beacon aqueous micro shunt that I've shown you on the screen here. And this is a fluidic channel engineered to lower pressure through a transcorneal approach. And this device is applied transcorneal at the limbal region in order to shunt fluid onto the ocular surface. Uh, we, we understand that that inherently sounds dangerous, but the company has designed this in order to create uh, biomaterials in order to create, uh, prevent biofilms that develop on the device. And this device has a one-way flow mechanism to prevent microorganisms from re-entering to the eye. But stay tuned, the company is still working on uh, its predictability and, and making sure that they can bring a uh, device that is safe to the market. I want to just add a little bit about the GAT technique because I know that many of the devices that I've mentioned in the previous slides are not available in India. So there are some mix options that are currently available to you that I know many of you have currently have adopted in your practice. And that's the GAT technique. Uh, the GAT technique uses a 5-0 proline suture, uh, mi reusable micro forceps, low temp cautery in order to flange the tip of the proline and allows us to create between 180 degrees or maybe even less, maybe even 90 degrees if you so choose or up to 360 degrees of treatment. Uh, this is a fantastic technique that I think has really brought MIG surgery uh, to the rest of the world. And I would encourage you, if you have not adopted it already, to consider adding this as maybe one of your first MIGS procedures in your armamentarium. The final technique that I wanted to mention was the bang technique. Uh, this was popularized and pioneered by Arsham Shabani from Washington University in St. Louis. And it uses a 25 gauge or 27 gauge needle, which all of us have access to. And you simply take a needle driver or needle holder and bend a 25 gauge or 27 gauge needle. And you use it to create a goniectomy, similar to what we can do with a cohook dual blade or a trabectome. And this can be used to simply strip away the trabecular meshwork in a similar fashion uh, for an extremely low cost. So uh, consider, adding this to your armamentarium as well in order to employ a goniectomy technique that is very low cost. So thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have about MIG surgery, but I think one of the parting lessons that I wanted to give about MIG surgery in general is that MIG really works best in the early spectrum of the disease. It's not really appropriate for late stage disease or where you need to have very low intraocular pressure. So I encourage all of you, to, uh, to really think of it as an early to mild, you're gonna have the best results in the early mild to moderate disease. That, with that being said, I think there are sometimes indications where we feel like there are poor options for, 
or traditional glaucoma surgery in our severe patients where this may be our only option. And the other lesson about MIGS is that we are now moving into a space where we're combining MIGS options. So for example, let's say you were to do a goniectomy, uh, maybe combining that with CPC or a cyclobladive technique may give us more profound results. Uh, so I think there's this MIGS space, while we traditionally think it works best in our mild to moderate severe or mild to moderate glaucoma patients, it may be an option for certain severe stage patients. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Craig, for giving us such an extensive overview. Um, I'll start with some questions. Uh, what is the percentage reduction in intraocular pressure do you expect in these procedures? How close to 10 over 10 over 10 you get in these cases? Great question. I think in general, if you were to take all the, the studies that have been published for MIGS devices, most patients will end up in the mid-teens. Now, one thing that we're finding in our, in our clinical experience is that, for example, placing an eye stent, simply putting it anywhere you want in the trabecular or in the, in the canal uh, may give you variable results. But one of the things that we're doing now more routinely is before surgery is looking on the ocular surface, looking for episcleral veins and looking for any areas that we think may be more promising in order to bypass. During surgery, a few tips in terms of where to apply those stents and devices include looking for areas where we know there could be uh, increased flow, such as extra pigment in an area. Uh, that may indicate that those are areas that are flowing. Many of you have done intraoperative gonioscopy and have seen patchy pigmentation. And that's actually a clue to tell you where the flow may be occurring. And so that may allow us to better target our angle-based procedures, such as goniectomy or uh, device-based procedures, such as the eye stent. So around mid-teens in general, but we do find that there are some patients that can achieve uh, close to IOPs and uh, close to 10 uh, with combination techniques. One of the techniques that I like doing is both viscodilation with a stent. So I do ABIC, ab internal canaloplasty, and then I apply a hydrus microshunt in an area where I think there is the most flow. And I seem to be getting lower results on average into the low teens in some patients if we can catch them early enough. So then, uh, supposing there has been a case of a trap failure, I don't think after what you said, you would think of doing a mixed procedure in these cases, would you? Yes, I, th I think one of the things that we're learning about um, the eye system and its in, in, in aqueous flow and plumbing is that, for example, we've had some patients where you do a trabeculectomy, it seems to work for a period of time, and then because of reasons, because maybe they were a poor candidate for subconjunctival filtration, we've gone back into the angle to do a GAT procedure or a trabectome procedure, and we found that it can work. And I think part of the issue is that when you shunt fluid through the conjunctival space, there may be some uh, modulation to the actual conventional flow pathway. And if we can wake up that pathway later, um, it may actually be revived and it may actually create some flow. Now, in some cases of severe disease, the distal outflow channel system is atrophic and is going to not yield very poor or is going to going to yield very poor results. Uh, one of the things that we've been using is uh, um, a proxy for understanding who may who may benefit from angle based procedures is as you do your visual field test. If the mean deviation is over minus 12 that might be a proxy for more severe disease that may portend a poor prognosis for angle-based procedures of any kind. Uh, this was found in, in Dr. Devinder Grover's study. Uh, as, as, as they looked at their long-term results of GAT, they found that patients who had a mean deviation, I believe over uh, minus 12, really had a lot poor outcomes and didn't do well for their long-term outcomes. Well, Murli, you lost some questions. Yeah, Dr. Craig, uh, I have a question for you. That is, in uh, patients, I have a uh, patient with a severe ocular surface disease and severe dry eye, uh, open angle end stage glaucoma, and pressures of 28 on maximum medical therapy. So he seems to be a poor candidate for trabeculectomy because the dry eye is really severe. Uh, would uh, GAT work in this case? Can it be combined with cyclog G6? Have you combined uh, GAT with cyclog G6 in these patients? Is that an option? I think so. I think this is a, a reasonable option for patients who are very poor candidates. Um, you know, you could either decide to do it at the same time or stage the procedure. Uh, you could simply start with the angle-based procedure first and see what kind of results you get. And be also, you know, most of the time when we're doing angle-based procedures, we're typically operating in the nasal angle. 
Uh, but don't be afraid to come across the eye and look in the temporal angle. Um, you may find better, you know, healthier tissue, or you may find clues in the angle uh, to give you some indication of where to actually do your angle-based procedure. Uh, or you could do it simultaneously. So I think staged an approach, a staged approach or a combined approach simultaneously uh, of combining those two techniques could work for your patient. Uh, I have a question both for Dr. Craig and Dr. Tanuj. Uh, how would you choose glaucoma patients for a premium IUL uh, surgery? Your thoughts individually, in different parts of the countries? Yes, so great question about phacal emulsification and premium IOLs for, or just cataract surgery for, for glaucoma patients. I will give you my general bias. While lens technology is improving in terms of presbyopic options that we have for patients, I think most of our current technique, our uh, current technologies that we have for IOLs do reduce contrast. In my opinion, reducing contrast in a patient who already has a disease that reduces contrast is not ideal. And so I tend to really avoid using premium IOLs in glaucoma patients, except for very extenuating circumstances for patients with extremely mild disease that have pre-parametric disease where their visual field is, is full. I may consider using an extended depth of field lens. Um, we have some new lenses that will be non-diffractive techniques that may actually prove to be helpful for patients uh, who have glaucoma. So this is a new space, uh, but I think in general, my general party line is that I don't use any type of diffractive technique or extended depth of field lenses in my glaucoma patients. With that being said, I think toric lenses is something that's definitely available for, should be available to all of our glaucoma patients. Um, and in the future, we will have some non-diffractive presbyopic options um, that may allow us to use premium IOLs in our glaucoma patients. One technique that I use often is actually just a little bit of mini monovision uh, to extend the depth for patients to give them more uh, working distance. And I think that's an appropriate technique as well as to use monovision. Uh, Dr. Tanush? So I think I'll agree with Craig. The only difference is once you have primary angle closure with ocular hypertension and you're doing an early lens extraction. So there maybe you could use uh, multifocal lenses because there is no retinal nerve fiber layer damage. So that is one subgroup when you're doing an early lens extraction, primary angle closure, not primary angle closure glaucoma. So Otherwise, I think once you get an RNFL defect or a visual field defect, you should only use a monofocal IOL. And one quick question to Dr. Craig, have you had late onset spontaneous hyphema after GAT? Uh, well, yes, it's a great question. And I think one of the things that we're trying to learn ex exactly what happens and why these patients may develop late onset hyphemas, I really encourage patients to be very careful about Valsalva, as well as their activities. Uh, we have found that some patients tend have laid on that particular side. If they sleep on one side more, they may have uh, more prominent hyphemas on that side. But typically the, the, the settings where we're seeing late onset hyphemas is in patients who are doing some either breath holding or even doing yoga with a down head position uh, for prolonged periods. Those are, t those are occasions when we're seeing prolonged hyphemas. They tend to be very transient and self-limiting. Um, and as long as, you know, these happen, the hyphemas happen because you are able, not able to, um, you have increased episcleral venous pressure that causes retrograde flow of blood. And so it can be disconcerting for patients, but fortunately it's, it, it's self-limiting. Now, one of the, the, I think the things that really uh, is discouraging for, for MIGS, early MIGS adopters in the GAT space, for example, is having the early onset hyphemas actually, you know, pro, 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 prolonged and pronounced hyphemas post-surgery. So a few techniques that may help you in your GAT hyphema rate is one, we leave viscoelastic inside the eye at the end of surgery to help prevent rapid decompression. Uh, maybe about 30 to 40% fill with a cohesive viscoelastic may help to prevent that rapid decompression. Number two, immediately after the surgery, you should try to put the patient in a reverse Trendelenburg position. Try to get the feet down immediately, get the head up high, so the patient is not lying supine for too long, uh, which may also promote hyphemas. Um, and I think those things have really improved our hyphema rate and, and made it so that we're seeing a lot less. Also take some time after the, the trabeculotomy has been completed, or if you decide to do 180 degrees or 360, 
is to use your uh, BSS solution, your balanced salt solution or lactated ringers and to really spend some time flushing and irrigating the entire eye. And that helps to push blood down further the distal outflow channel and prevent that blood from quickly coming into the anterior chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig. Stay with us till the end of the meeting with your uh, inputs. Uh, thanks a lot. We go on to our next speaker, Dr. Ronnie George, a senior glaucoma consultant from Medical Research Foundation, a great national and international presence and repute with innumerable awards and accolades. And he is going to talk to us on a very quintessential topic from clinical trials to clinical practice. We look forward to hearing from you, doctor. You are uh, muted. Can you unmute yourself? <clears throat> Tony, you are muted. Uh, why is it his? Okay. Uh, right, right. So can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. And I'm going to try and cover some of the clinical trials and how they're, I'm using them in practice today. I'll start with the ocular hypertension treatment study and the early manifest glaucoma um, and the EGPS study. So basically, if you look at the early, uh, the ocular hypertension treatment study, we did notice that intraocular pressure reduction prevented progression in ocular hypertensives. And what we realized is that if you treat 16 people for five years, we can prevent one progression. But what you also look at in the study is that 90% did not progress even without treatment. 40% of those who were on treatment required more than one medication to reach a 20% intraocular pressure reduction and 9% required three or more drugs. So none developed site threatening field loss. So because of this, we can consider monitoring most ocular hypertensive patients even after risk assessment. And when you look at risk assessment, both the ocular hypertension treatment study, which showed that the group with the highest intraocular pressures and the lowest central corneal thicknesses, and the European glaucoma prevention study showed the same risk factors that this group, the group with the uh, thinnest corneas and the highest intraocular pressures were the, at the greatest risk of progression. And if you apply the same number needed to treat calculation here, you find that you can reduce the NMT to six by just treating those at highest risk for progression. So that's something that we have applied in our practice very commonly in trying to decide who uh, to treat among the ocular hypertensives. The other thing that came out of the ocular hypertension treatment studies, when they looked at progression, when they looked at the, both the medication and the observation group, the majority of people showed progression on the optic disc alone. And this has got more uh, uh, evidence of late that more disc changes occurred early in disease. And perhaps we should pay attention to structural change in addition to functional change in these patients. Moving now to people with manifest glaucoma, the early manifest glaucoma study basically looked at treatment versus no treatment for people with established disease. And here too, you saw a significant reduction in progression in people who were treated for uh, established glaucoma versus untreated. And from the MGT, we realized that patients should have be followed up more closely with visual fields during the first few years after diagnosis, because progression may occur in half of your patients even after you have reduced, uh, reduced IOP by 25%. So the EMGT, the concerns that we had basically was the treatment was probably inadequate because they had a combination of trabeculoplasty and betoxylol. And fortunately, about in the last decade, we had the UK GTS, which looked at latinopros versus a placebo in these patients. And look at this uh, thing in the study design that they have. They planned for 16 fields over 24 months. And the majority of their patients actually had IOPs less than 21. Even in this group, they noticed that patients who were started on treatment did progress much less slowly than patients who were not started on treatment. And in both these studies, what you saw was visual field progression was much more commonly seen than optic disc progression. In fact, if you look at this, this is again from the uh, UK PDS, uh, UK GTS study, at approximately three to six months, you started to be able to detect visual field progression because you did intensive visual field testing. 
and this effect slowly increased over time. So if you do adequate visual field testing, you can even start to see progression as early as three months uh, into the uh, post-disease uh, detection. What about once you have had established glaucoma? And here you have the AGI study and the um, advanced glaucoma intervention study basically looked at intraocular pressure in two ways. One is a predictive analysis, which looked at the average intraocular pressure over the first three month, three, six month visits. And the associative analysis, which looked at the percentage of visits with an intraocular pressure where of less than 18 millimeters of mercury. And what you notice over here is for the predictive analysis, that is of the first three visits, if you had lower mean IOPs in the first three visits, you were much less likely to progress. For the associative analysis, which is an IOP of less than 18 millimeters over 60 years, you could see that as the mean IOP was less, you were much, much, much less likely to progress. So from this, you have basically two points. One is intraocular pressure reduces visual field progression. We know that there may be a dose response relationship in the sense that the, high, the lower the IOP, the less risk of visual field progression. And fluctuation is an important part of the damaging effect of intraocular pressure. So it's important not only to reduce IOP adequately, but also to minimize fluctuation. Switching gears a little bit now to the TVT study, and this is the, uh, the first TVT study. And basically they concluded that tube shunt had a higher success rate compared to trabeculectomy during five years of follow-up. And, but both procedures had similar IOP reduction and use of supplemental therapy at five years, and that additional glaucoma surgery was needed more frequently after trabeculectomy with mitomycin than tube shunt placement. But the concerns with the study were basically their inclusion criteria, because they did include patients who had a previous failed trabeculectomy. And we know that eyes that have failed a trabeculectomy once are more likely to fail it again, and therefore this could have biased the results significantly. And therefore, they did not really change our treatment pattern too much after seeing the results of this study. And uh, we were basically fortunate that soon after that, we had the primary TVT study, which showed you that the trabeculectomy actually did better than the, uh, uh, than the tube group, in addition to having lower intraocular pressure levels, at least at the one year. And even the three-year data is similar. Uh, switching to the light study, which came out recently, where, which looked at the SLT versus eye drops for, as first-line treatment for ocular hypertension and glaucoma. At 36 months, more than 95% of eyes were a target in trouble pressure in both groups. And here, the target was, was calculated individually for each patient. What's interesting here is that 75% of eyes maintained target IOP at, with one SLT treatment over three years. And about 68, 67, 68% of eyes were controlled adequately with one single eye drop in the medication group. So SLT is a valid primary treatment for primary glaucoma. It also shows that a lot of our patients, we may be able to achieve fairly good uh, IOP control with some of the newer medications available to us, and we may not need to escalate that uh, frequently. But what was also uh, new here was that the group in SLT also required as much follow-up as a group on medication. So that does not come down. Moving now to the uh, to angle closure disease, and here you have the uh, Eagle study, which was basically a randomized control trial, which looked at the early lens extraction for the treatment of primary angle closure glaucoma. They had patients who were with primary angle closure glaucoma who basically had an IOP of more than 21 at least once. And you also have, had patients with primary angle closure who had at least one IOP of more than 30 millimeters of mercury. And on the angle, they had more than 180 degrees of apposition or sinical closure. In their results, which was primarily looking at quality of life, they found slightly better quality of life. I want to keep that aside. And they found slightly lower intraocular pressure uh, in the clear lens extraction group of about minus 1.2 millimeters of mercury. I'm going to show you this plot here, and I want you to focus on the right side of the screen. And here I have circled these factors. And what I want you to look at is here. If you look at the non-Chinese ethnicity, you find that the intraocular pressure actually was not significantly different between the groups. If you look at primary angle closure, again, you find that the intraocular pressure was not significantly different between the groups. And if you look at uh, the visual acuity on the left side of the chart, you find that it was uh, not significant in patients who had better than 85 ETDRS letters in terms of quality of life. So what but basically happened is people who had a little bit of cataract, well, the cataract extraction improved the quality of life. But in terms of the IOP, the IOP reductions were actually not really uniform and were pretty small. It was just about 1.2 millimeters of mercury. And it did not answer my biggest questions on the role of clear lens extraction. Basically, what happened to the angle? 
there was a lot of missing data at the final visit, and therefore you cannot make any conclusions about what happened to the angle. Intraocular pressure differences were just about a millimeters of mercury, and there was no real disc or field changes. So the Eagle study did not really change my clinical practice, and I have not really incorporated its findings into practice. So to summarize, for ocular hypertension, titrate risk, look for structural damage. For early glaucoma, do adequate visual field testing, and both medications and SLT may be effective in achieving this. For established POIG, aim for lower intraocular pressure and minimize fluctuation if you can. Trabeculectomy is still my first choice for primary surgery. And clear lens extraction, in my opinion, there's inadequate evidence to suggest its use. Thank you. Uh, that was a lovely talk and a very, uh, a very good summary. But I have this question. Uh, are the advanced uh, glaucoma intervention recommendations still valid? That is less than 18 millimeter mercury in all visits and majority in less than 14. Would you try to keep the IOP in that range or would you look at it keeping it lower after what we understand more today? No, I think it needs to be kept. I mean, this is just, these are just averages. So basically, when you look at less than 18, you still had progression. The no progression was seen in the less than 12 group. And I think one thing that we should remember is that even though it was called the advanced glaucoma intervention study, they were not really all that patients with really advanced glaucoma that, that, that the way that we see in India. So those patients, maybe we would aim for a lower target intraocular pressure, but otherwise it's better to go with an individual target intraocular pressure for every patient based on their presenting intraocular pressure and the amount of damage rather than using a uniform cutoff of 18 or 12 or 14. Um, Murli? Uh, Murli, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Uh, so would you use uh, risk calculators in deciding whether an ocular hypertension patient's, uh, patient needs treatment or not, or observation? Uh, how valuable are these risk calculators? See, the risk calculator is an easy way of demonstrating to the patient what the risk is. The only issue with the risk calculator there is the diabetes, because the diabetes was actually protective in the ocular hypertension treatment study. So that, that's the only concern I have. Otherwise, the risk factor is a good way of telling the patient what the risks are. But keep in mind that Indian corneal thicknesses are not the same as the Western corneal thicknesses. Our corneal thicknesses are a little lower by maybe about 20 microns or so. So you don't extrapolate uh, the actual values, but you can extrapolate the risk factors. Murli, you have any one more question before we go on to our uh, the next talk? Uh, yes. So uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, are the uh, findings of the CJIT study, initial glaucoma treatment study, uh, valid in the Indian uh, scenario? Uh, does it guide us as to what uh, we need to choose as our initial treatment for a, a glaucoma yeah, patient? I, I didn't put it in, in, in the interest of time. So basically, when you look at the CJIT study, both medication and surgery did equally well. But surgery was complicated by poorer quality of life uh, values, mostly because a majority of patients developed a cataract. And again, this, the, uh, the study was done some time back. So I'm sure with the newer medications and the better surgical techniques that we have today, I don't know whether the same would hold true even now. Yes, very true. That was a great talk, Dr. Rodi. Stay with us. Uh, we'll go on to the next session. After some terrific talks by the leaders in glaucoma practice, we are now going to move on to some fiery debates. Our first speaker in this subset would be Dr. Rashmi Krishnamurthy, consultant glaucoma at LVPI, who's dealing with complex glaucoma cases in her practice. And she's uh, the ideal one to talk on Kahoop dual blade is the way to go in mix. On to you, Dr. Rashmi. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Can you see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, IOS and Dr. Chitra for giving me this opportunity. I would like to argue that Kahoot Dual Blade is the new way to go in mixer. So conventional filtration surgeries that we are doing, like trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage diseases, devices are definitely effective in IOP reduction but they are associated with unfavorable safety profile. If we come to trap the bleb related complications and the serious site threatening complications, and if we come to implants, tube and plate exposures and implant related and hypertensive phase and failed implants related problems. So can we really avoid these complications? 
So minimally invasive uh, glaucoma surgeries described in 2012, which are ab interno approach, have some things in common, like which is already described, but described earlier, uh, minimal trauma to the tissue, faster operating time, high safety profile, rapid recovery with minimal detrimental impact on the quality of life with modest efficacy. Along with that, there is conjunctiva and scleral sparing surgeries. They, for the future filtration surgeries, they help no bleb or hypotony or site threatening complication, reduces the depend or dependence on anti-glaucoma medication and because in open angle glaucoma, the trabecular meshwork is the uh, site of uh, outflow resistance, this targets at that. So today will be, I'm talking about the Schlem's canal opening uh, procedures, mainly the debate is on KDB versus GAT. So KDB is based on the goniotomy procedure that was described at Barkin very early. And this actually has a dual blade, a sharp tip and a ramp. Once the sharp tip engage, inserts or pierces the trabecular meshwork, ramp lifts the strip and the dual blade cuts the lifted strip. So the above is the uh, steps animated video that is there in New World Medical Law website. After the fake oil emulsification, the microscope angle is changed to 45 degrees. And then after filling the anterior chamber with visco, the, on the cornea and under surface of the gonior lens, the eyeball is moved inferiorly or the opposite angle. If you're doing temporal phaco, the patient is asked to move nasally. So once the trabecular meshwork is visualized, KDB blade is introduced and then the goniotomy is proceeded. The tip first pierces the trabecular meshwork and then the ramp lifts and the dual blade cuts or excises the trabecular meshwork. The amount of, there is some amount of blood that is, uh, is seen. That is a good sign that we, have, we are at the correct position and care should be taken that we visualize the angle at all the uh, time and residual strips of the trabecular meshwork are removed with the uterus forceps, which is confirmed with a gonio mirror also. So at the end of the surgery, it looks very neat and clean, uh, like our standard procedure. So postoperatively, we can see that uh, there's, this is the area where it was done. In our series, intraoperative hyphema as documented is the most common. So we can see that from the baseline, it has reduced the medication and also the intraocular pressure. We had done a nine eyes where the intraocular pressure was under control with maximum medication in POAG eyes. All the in, uh, complications also decrease within a week. And these are some of the contraindications where there is preoperative, very high IOP, low target IOP required, new vessels and disclosure and who have allergy to medication. Coming to the argument between uh, comparing with GAT and uh, KDB goniotomy, first is the degrees of treatment. So in GAT, 360 degrees is uh, targeted, whereas in KDB, it's 90 to 110 degrees. So this is a direct comparative study between KDB and GAT where the intraocular pressure reduction and the medication reduction is not okay. statistically significant. But uh, they conclude that more eyes undergoing KDB uh, achieved a target of less than 18 and less than 15. So a full 360 degree TM procedure may not be necessary to achieve maximum efficacy. Second is the cost. So how to decrease the cost of KDB? One thing with the advantages that is it has, if more number of uh, people start using it, now the cost is around 25,000 to uh, Indian, Indian rupees. So the cost will definitely come down. And the second thing is this. This is the needle like already described. So first time I saw this, I have to thank Dr. Swati, Dr. Pavan and Dr. Venkatesh from Arvin Group. This I saw as a winner video last year the ASCR is where the tip of the 25 gauge needle is bent and definitely the cost of it is not to be even thought of. The third thing is the complications. The studies have shown that there is not much difference between the two, though in the GAT procedure, the percentage of eyes which had a steroid induced spike and a high femur were more, but they were resolved medically. Then the last thing is the learning curve. Those of us who are doing a conventional goniotomy with a needle or an NVR blade in childhood glaucomas, I think this should not be a difficult procedure at all. And uh, it is very easy to learn. And definitely as we are seeing whatever we are doing, it should not be a problem. So it has a faster learning curve because of the good visibility. Uh, though once GAT is learned, uh, it is uh, definitely 
uh, proven to be effective, but it has a steeper learning curve. So mix definitely is promising and we are going to use them increasingly in future. What we have to really think about is how much the IOP decreases and how long it works, what's the cost of it, is it available to us and how easy it is to learn. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashmi. They gave a, a good punch. She's going to be now countered by Dr. Swati Upadhyaya, who's the medical consultant, Glockma Services from Marvindai Hospital, Pondicherry. And she's going to tell us that cost is the overriding concern and she's going to vouch for that. Look forward to hearing you. Swati, unmute yourself. Can, uh, is my, are my slides visible? Ma'am? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Thank everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chitramo and AIOC ARC for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to, yes, no, it's, it's going to come. I'm going to speak in favor of GAT, conioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy, specifically suja GAT. Cost is always the overriding concern because one can't see the hard and money go waste over a fancy item, not serving the purpose for which it was bought. And in this case, it is Kahook dual blade. So I'll definitely vouch for GAD. So let's debate. So as Dr. Chaya and Dr. Rashmi has, uh, have already told about the, in, the specifications of mix, I would just take you through the instruments required for GAD. First is the low temperature cautery, 5-0 proline suture, 25 gauge MVR blade, Helon GV, or you can use Orogel, MST forceps, Swan Jacob Gonio prism, and the McPherson's forceps. So if you see, uh, almost all the instruments are easily available, only you have to buy a low temperature cautery. And now Aurolab is, tr is trying to make pre-mushroomed pre, uh, sutures, which, can, which will be uh, easily available over a, over a period of time. But the, the fascinating thing is one low temperature cautery can be ETO'd and, and it can be used over around 25 cases, which is my personal experience. Also, Gonio prism is both common to uh, KDV as well as GAD. So now I'll just take you through uh, the steps of GAD surgery, suture GAD surgery. So your first step is to blunt the uh, tip of the 5-0 proline suture so that it becomes little mushroom shaped so that it doesn't traumatize or create a pulse passage while the suture is advancing inside the Schlem's canal. Then you make a parasynthesis, then fill the anterior chamber with Helon GV, then tilt the patient's head away from you, 45 degrees, and tilt the microscope towards you so that you get a bang on uh, view of the uh, angle. So the requisite, this is, is common to both KDP and GAT that you have to have a tiltable microscope. Then you introduce the blunted 5-0 proline suture into the uh, anterior chamber. You sit temporarily so that you can aim at the nasal angle. Under gonioscopic visualization, do a limited goniotomy using a 25 gauge MVR blade. And then introduce this blunted tip of the uh, proline suture into the Schlem's canal, which is lying up just behind the trabecular meshwork. With gentle strokes, keep on pushing the 5-0 proline suture until it starts appearing from the other side. Once it starts, uh, completely gets out from the other side, catch hold of the other end and then take off the cornea prism and pull it from the outside using McPherson's forceps. So how beautifully you create a 360 degree trabeculotomy. Now you wash the viscoelastic Helon GV and the blood, the, the reflex will come from the Schlem's canal. That is a good sign that you are you have opened the actually the Schlem's canal. Now you see for the blanching of the episcleral venous vessels, which they call as a episcleral venous wave. So this shows that the now the fluid is raining from the nasal angle and going to the collector channels. So how easily you can perform a GAD surgery. So these are the results which uh, I would say that Gonioscopy, uh, Davinder Grover and uh, group have published that it shows excellent results. And this is another group which says that it is uh, like it has got a low rate of complications and it is congenital sparing nature of surgery. One study which uh, Rashmi has told uh, also says that the, both the KDP and GAT are equally effective and uh, KDP is uh, and limited goniotomy is as equal as 360 degree goniotomy. So these are the similarities. Intraop gonioscopy is common, tiltable microscope is common, high viscosity OVD. Learning curve, yes, I agree. Suture GAT has got a larger, longer learning curve than KDP, but scarring on the angle over period of time occurs in both as i've seen in both the cases i've done kdbs i've done gat 
So it happens in both. Extent of goniotomy, yes, 360 degrees in GAT and 120 to 180 degrees maximum in KDP. Approval is not needed for suture GAT, but yes, KDP still needs to be approved in India. Uh, suture can be used over multiple cases, 25 cases, uh, low temperature cautery can be used and one proline suture can be used mm -hmm. for over 10 cases. So I would like to say suture GAT is an effective mix which leads to formal approval in India and which can be performed at 100th of the cost of a KDP. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. <clears throat> Either of you could answer me, Dr. Ashmi or uh, would you consider doing it in narrow angle uh, eyes or would you think of doing it after a cataract surgery, if at all, in these situations? So, uh, narrow angle eyes, it is not usually recommended, but after cataract surgery, I have seen Dr. Kiril Doraraj, who has been doing uh, KDB goniotomy, he says that if gonio uh, sinicolysis is done, then and the angle structures are visualized, then it is done. But definitely, uh, for the beginners or for those who are doing it the first yeah, time, it should not be tried. It's only uh, ideal in the initial phases to do only in open angle cases. So ma'am, we had one case where we did gonio sinicolysis with KDB, but over a period of time and phaco emulsification. So all the three things were done, but over a period of the, the, the angle still became narrow, the scarring happened and the patient finally landed up with RD. So I don't think the results are good with KDB. And ma'am, GAT, I have done on cases, but still I won't say, I won't recommend for angle closure cases. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. Can you ask the next question? Uh, yes, madam. I have a question for uh, either of you or uh, Dr. Craig could answer it. Uh, because uh, Kahoop dual blade is an excisional goniotomy and uh, uh, GAT is an incisional goniotomy. So uh, can Kahoop double blade, dual blade be tried if uh, the GAT procedure fails after some time? Because after some time, the trabecular shelf uh, disappears over part of the uh, angle. I mean, I would say sometimes even up to 180 degree, it can disappear. So in those cases, whatever I'm, I'm tissues in the to area answer. of the trabecular measure can be tried in excisional goniotomy like KDB or uh, trabectome in, the, in those cases. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Murli. Uh, I do see my uh, my angles as if they were, I have not done a goniotomy or a GAT. They, they close, the cleft closes over a period of time. And I see in the superior angle, more prominent clefts rather than the nasal angle. And still some little, little path will come on. But I haven't tried a KDB or a GAT. But yes, uh, I, I don't know. Rashmi, so, what do you do? In K, I, have, I don't have any experience with GAT. Uh, once I tried, but I could not pass the suture at all through the Schlenz canal. But with KDB, I can tell that if uh, for initially when we were doing, I was not giving pilocarpine. And uh, wherever the goniotomy was done, the sinic were developing. So there, definitely, I don't think we could do anything else. But nowadays, uh, after doing three to uh, four weeks of pilocarping, the area where the KDB is done, definitely it looks uh, uh, to be uh, white and uh, not similar to what it was in the trabecular meshwork. So I'm not sure whether it closes unless we do a ASOCT-based study or a histopathology to know whether that area is closing. But uh, IOP-wise, they're doing very well. Unlikely that it closes after an excisional biopsy. Uh, Dr. Chaya can comment on this. Yeah, you know, I, this brings up a lot of issues with regards to doing either a, a GAT or a KDB type of goniectomy procedure. I think it is possible. I, I have a few congenital glaucoma patients where I've done a GAT and have come back later to do a repeat GAT. Uh, with with still similar results. So I think part of it is understanding the nature of the tissue healing response in the angle post-surgery. We still don't know a lot. We still don't understand why some patients who have a trabecular shelf do well and why some people with a trabecular shelf don't do well. And I think this is the, the dynamic nature of the conventional outflow pathway. As I alluded to, it's not homogenous. It's not continuous throughout the entire canal. So while you may see a trabecular shelf in a particular area, and in that patient, if it's not working, you have to come to the conclusion that there's something wrong further downstream, right? And so I think all options are open for patients, but understanding why a patient may not be doing well, it may not be due to your technique. You may do perfectly elegant surgery, but it may have to do just with the disease process and the staging of the patient. Thank you. Uh, we shall go on to the third debate uh, because uh, Dr. Uh, Swahasini has uh, is got held up and we'll come back to them as the last. 
The next debate team would be held by Dr. Sujini Shroff, who would be debating on a very interesting topic, very relevant to us in our day-to-day -day practice. Mitomycin by sponges prior to trabeclectomy. I vouch for a traditional approach. Dr. Sujini Shroff is a practicing glaucoma consultant from Nara Netralia, Bangalore, and uh, has authored several Indian and in, uh, international publications. On to you, Dr. Sujini. Unmute yourself. Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. At the onset, I'd like to thank uh, ARC, AIOS, and Dr. Chitra for giving me this opportunity to present this panel. Uh, today, my topic is mitomycin C by sponge, the traditional approach. So the outcomes of trabeclectomy have improved vastly since the usage of MMC 30 years back. Various methods for the delivery of MMC have been studied. The latest being the sub injection of MMC, which has definitely shown promising results. However, I would like to highlight a few points on why sponge is still preferred by many. In trabeclectomy, we aim to produce diffuse blebs and not cystic localized thin wall blebs. Previously, the anterior placement of mitomycin C sponge and limbus base flap were responsible for the complications post trabeclectomy. With the adoption of Moorfield safe surgical technique, the occurrence of these blebs can be avoided by a wide subconjunctival dissection, phonics base flap, with multiple mitomycin C sponge kept as posteriorly as possible without touching the conjunctival edge. The primary concern with sponge has been fragmentation of sponge and leaving behind remnant of MMC soak sponge, which can lead to granulomatous reaction, necrosis and leakage. This was however common in older sponge material like methyl cellulose. With newer materials like polyvinyl alcohol and gelatin, the chance of fragmentation is not there. To avoid retaining the mitomycin C sponge, sponge count and thorough irrigation should be done on removal. Even with injection MMC, there is still a possibility of incomplete removal as the drug can be retained in the hydrated T-nodes. Other methods to avoid leaving behind the sponge are usage of suture on the sponge. This can be either multiple sponge on a single suture or single sponge on a single suture. Experimental studies have been done on staining of the mitomycin C with tripan blue to identify the extent of the antifibrotic treatment and sponge visualization. The MMC sponge can be placed sub under direct visualization, taking care to avoid the cut conjunctival edge. In trabeclectomy, we like to avoid a subconjunctival bleed at all costs because this can lead to fibroblast pro proliferation and failure. This, there is a risk of this subconjunctival hemorrhage with an injection. There's also a small risk of intrascleral injection of mitomycin C. MMC sponge has stood the test of time with various improvisations to give good outcomes for trabeclectomy. Though injection mitomycin C has shown comparable results, there are still no long-term prospective randomized control studies yet to show its superiority to sponge. For, sur for surgeons who prefer, for surgeons who prefer doing primary trabeclectomies in secondary glaucomas like uveitic, traumatic, anterior segment dysgenesis, neovascular glaucomas, or even in childhood glaucomas, there's still insufficient literature for the dosage of mitomycin C by injection and their outcomes. In conclusion, a recent survey to show the intraoperative use of MMC in UK showed that majority of the surgeons, nearly 75% of them, still use mitomycin C sp soak sponge over other delivery forms. Hence, until further evidence, each surgeon can choose what works best in their hands to give optimal blebs and IOP control for their patients. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very crisp debate of yours, uh, Dr. Sujini. So we have Dr. Shushmita Kaushik, an eminent surgeon here, who's going to tell us that uh, mitomycin by injection is the way to go. So let's hear what she has to counter. On to you, Dr. Sushmita. Thank you, Dr. Chitra, and uh, thank you, AIOS, for having me. Is it visible now? Uh, no. No? Okay. 
I'll share again. Does it come on now? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, all right. Right, so as the, the topic says, uh, we must be tuned to the times, isn't it? And if we are doing the same thing that we've been doing all our lives, then we are stagnating as Dr. Chaya quoted his mentor. So um, I, I'm going to make the case for MMC by injection. Um, there's no question of the utility of MMC. It's almost universally used during trabeculectomy. We know it prevents fibroblast proliferation and excessive tenon scarring. And the most commonly used dose is about 0.2 milligram per ml for about two to three minutes by sponge. So the question is how to apply that? Um, is it on table by soaked sponge or just prior to surgery by injection? So um, logically, why not inject? Um, it takes less time if using a sponge average two to three minutes. Sitting in an OR for three minutes with nothing to do is really, really a long time and it feels like an eternity. Uh, there are no dangers of lost sponges. Sometimes a piece of sponge breaks off or maybe routine or maybe retained at times. You can forget how many there are and that's a disaster. And uh, if you use an injection, the exact dose of MMC is actually known because as we all know, we have no idea how much of mitomycin we've put into the eye. Sometimes the sponges are thin, sometimes thick, sometimes two, sometimes three. So this is a known dose, a known volume. The exact amount of drug delivered is known. And the usual dose is 0.1 ml of 0.1% MMC kept for about two minutes. So MMC can be applied diffusely over a large area. So we know with Dr. Penkhor's work that uh, a wider application of MMC is required because of which we need to uh, dissect more. So for initial application requires a larger tenon's pocket. And while injecting, there's no border, there's no restriction to diffuse application. We can actually have a very wide injection and have a wide application of the MMC. And then there's no harm. There's no risk of increased complication. There's no adverse effect as it were, if you inject it. And the sizable literature now shows that it does work. The IOP control is similar. The bleb morphology is better and lesser interventions have been known to be required uh, following a sponge. In the interest of time, I'm not going into the papers, but uh, this is what head to head uh, most papers have said. So the technique is uh, we uh, inject it after the block in the superior conjunctiva about eight to nine millimeters from the limbus. The volume is to be kept at about 0.1 cc. The concentration can be 0 0.05 to up to 0.4 milligram per ml. So whatever the surgeon is comfortable with, depending upon the condition of the eye that is titrated. But most commonly in all the, all the papers, it's been 0.1 milligram per ml. And then you need to be spread nicely with a muscle hook or maybe a sterile bud so that it's not a pocket of MMC, but it's nicely uh, spread out. So the question again, should we inject? Well, it's effective, it's easy, it's safe. Sure, we should, I think. I don't think there's a problem with that. The injection should definitely now be the way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Shishmit. It was very crisp when the message reached all of us. Uh, uh, Murli, you have a questions to ask? Uh, yes, madam. I have a question to ask uh, Dr. Shishmita and, uh, of course, uh, to the expert panel, Dr. Craig, Dr. Tanuj. Uh, if you inject mitomycin, uh, see, you don't uh, generally wash it off. I mean, that's what I've seen most surgeons doing. So is there a, a threat of uh, the mitomycin uh, tracking into the retrobulbar space or into the anterior chamber if you do a, a phaco trap? So how I would think, we avoid that? I think that's why the concentration is so less. So I think it has it has been titrated down to the uh, minimum dose required for effectivity. So, uh, you know, it's 0 0.2, 2 0.3 usually milligram, and this is 0 0.01, and it's only 0.1 ml. Uh, in the sponges, I'm sure the, the volume is so much more, which is probably why we need to inject it. And none of the studies so far, we can only quote evidence, none of them have shown any increased complication of either endothelial toxicity 
or uh, into the litter box space. So I, I presume it must be must be safe enough to do that. Uh, when it comes to using sponges, Dr. Sujini, how much area should be ideally covered? You should unmute yourself. Yes. Am I audible now? <clears throat> yes. Um, so wide um, posterior dissection as much as possible. Can, hello? Yes, yes, we can hear yes. you. Um, so the, ideally, we should um, do a subconjunctive, uh, subconjunctival dissection as posteriorly as possible so that we can keep the uh, sponge um, as away from the conjunctival cut edge as possible so that we avoid the complications of necrosis at the conjunctival tip. So a really wide conjunctival dissection is ideal. Something like three clock hours, I suppose? Yes, yes, three, uh, three to four, yes, three clock hours is ideal. That was a good debate, uh, which we heard now. I think we'll go on to the next team and keep all the questions in store uh, for the end of it. The next team is going to be led by Dr. Ganesh Raman, who will be debating on, I would not leave any part of the tube uncovered. A graft in place saves the show. And uh, Dr. Ganesh uh, heads the glaucoma department of the Coimbatore branch of Arvind Eye Care Services. Let's hear from you, Dr. Ganesh. Thank you, madam. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah. So this is GDD tube under cover. Uh, I would thank uh, AIOCRC and Dr. Chitra for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on this topic here. So this is what Dr. Uh, George is going to throw at me, you know. So advantage of the patchless Sadi. That's been his uh, uh, trademark. So you have a scleral tunnel, which is universally practiced. You have a long section of the tube, which is covered a snug fit of the tube, low profile of the implant, no movement of the tube, that's what is going to show. You can do argon laser suture of the tube ligature later on. You can monitor the tube easily by ASOCT. And if in the corona times, you don't have availability of patch graft. And also the prion disease, as though corona is not sufficient, is going to throw prion at us. So the publication that uh, patients with uh, patch graft uh, had more uh, tube-related complications, exposure, uh, compared to patients without uh, patch graft, which is his technique. And uh, prion disease is something which is very scary. And uh, this is a, a real risk. Uh, some publications have shown that uh, post-surgery, uh, 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 patients have developed uh, CJD, that is uh, 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 prion diseases in the uh, uh, recipient uh, 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 cornea of the patients and uh, post keratoplasty. And sometimes this is what uh, happens in long uh, You have a likely chance of impending erosion. And we treated this and it sort of uh, it's result, uh, in the resolution phase. So if you are not very comfortable, I would not really like to leave any part of the tube uncovered. At least uh, cover it with a, a patch graft or a long tunnel sclera. This is my technique, which I have uh, started using for almost uh, seven to eight years, alternative to patch graft you would find that uh, uh, you can create a tunnel of your own and uh, insert uh, the tube into a long tunnel and uh, avoid using patch graft if necessary. But there are certain situations where patch graft is required. I'll come to that later. So this is how you create a tunnel. It's about four millimeters in length. And then you insert the tube through the tunnel and the distal part is the track which you create with a 23 uh, gauge needle. So once you have inserted the, <clears throat> you can see the D figure here, you have a needle track which enters into the anterior chamber and the tube goes between the uh, incisions of the tunnel and then you insert the tube into the anterior chamber and then you close it with infinity sutures in the H figure in the lower down. So, so you could use uh, this technique in even fakic eyes. For example, this patient had a eye syndrome in which we placed a tunnel in this manner and with a small peephole uh, iridectomy you are able to place the uh, tube in the sulcus and you can do a ASOCT and find out where the tube is exactly placed. So these are some of the uses of a long tunnel technique and <clears throat> where is the patch graft useful whenever you wish to leave a large portion of the tube anticipating future surgeries or when you wish to place the tube in the vitreous cavity. One minute. 
So here you find, you can see that you can place the tube in the vitreous cavity and then you can cover it with the patch graft. And here you find that you make a S-shaped bend of the tube anticipating future surgery and then cover it with a tube. So definitely I would not like to leave uh, any uh, surface of the tube uncovered as much as possible. The tube should be preferably covered. Use a tunnel that track technique or a patch graft. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganesh. Let's hear from uh, Dr. George now. On to you, doctor. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much. I'm sure Dr. George is known to one and all of us, the chief of Glockma uh, Services at Arvindai Hospital, Arvindai Care Systems, Madurai. And I'm sure he's going to have a very effective counter at this point. Thank you very much, Chitra uh, ma'am. So, tube erosion is a concern when using an extracular implant. And covering the tube with a patch graft is not a full insurance that you can, uh, you can avoid this. So, here is a rare occurrence of a graft cube getting melted and the tube extruding. So I'm sure that many in this panel would have seen this over a, peri over a period of uh, years, the patch starts melting and we find the tube just lying underneath the conjunctiva. And most of them, yes, they do remain uh, stable for years together with just the conjunctiva overlying it. So we will look at three study groups who have reported their post-operative complications over a five-year follow-up, and all three study groups have used patch crafts to cover the tube. So this is the, the tube versus trabeculectomy group, and uh, the tube exposure in TBT was 5%. Five out of 107 patients, the tube group had to undergo a tube revision with new patch graft, graft after which two of these patients further had recurrent tube erosion, Another tube revision and one of these patients ended up with a removal of the tube. Coming to the ABC, the Ahmed Babel comparison group, again reported their complications during their four years of follow-up. They showed 3% of tube exposure in the AGV group, 1% in the Babel group. Revision for tube erosion was done in two of those AGVs. One of the AGVs was explanted and three in the BGI. So the same patient had three, three erosions. The lastly, the Ahmed, the AVB study, Again, 4% in the AGV group, 2% in the BGI group, revision with patch graft, 2 in the AGV, none in the BGI, both the BGIs were explanted, 3 of the AGVs were explanted. So tube exposure is a paramount concern when implanting the tube without a donor patch graft. However, all the studies, and this is precisely the reason why you don't see much literature, much on off this technique. However, all the studies using modified spiral tunnels, which Ganesh just now showed, and flaps do not report an incidence of tube exposure of more than two to three percent in ice without the patch graft. So this is the Felix Gill group from Mexico. They look, they describe, uh, they describe a technique of 22 or a 23 gauge needle generated three to four millimeter long needle track without fashioning a spiral flap or using a donor patch graft. They reported results of 128 Ahmed glaucoma valves in Mexican children with a mean follow-up of uh, more than two years, they encountered tube-related complications like tube retractions, lens touch, transitory endothelial loss. But what was amazing in this publication was that the tube exposures were nil, and that too, it is pediatric refractory glaucoma, which we know the tube exposures are much more than the adult group. So what we are advocating today is this a slight modification of this technique, a patch-free a flap-free tube implantation through a four millimeter, 23 gauge needle generated spiral track. And we do a little bit of markings to, mention, to ensure that an optimum two millimeter tube was left in the anterior chamber. We, we also mark the initial spiral groove to make sure that we get a four millimeter scleral track to insert the tube into the anterior chamber. We also try as much as possible to get both in the right and the left eye, we try to fashion the spiral tracks medial to the original position of the tube so that the tube enters the eye at around 12 o'clock. And, and the tubes entering the eye at 12 o'clock have the minimum possible contact to the upper eyelid, thus minimizing the risk of tube exposures. So as Ganesh has already shown this, we have uh, published our results. Uh, this paper has, uh, we have tried to describe the surgical technique as best as possible with a lot of uh, wealth of Professor Paul Palmberg's knowledge and experience 
thrown in the discussion part where there is a lot of useful practical tips on how to get the scleral tract right and also how to get the tube as close to the uh, iris as possible. This also has, this publication also has a link to a supplemental video which those of you who are interested could look at. So again, we saw that we didn't have any tube exposures in the non-patch group, both in the adult and the pediatric, uh, pediatric group. So in the adult, within the first year, we had two tube exposures. Pediatric, we had five guys within the first year having tube exposures. So again, there are three things which I would like to highlight. There is less elevation of the ocular surface, much smoother, less inflammation and better wound healing with this technique. Again, a flatter transition between the conjunctiva and cornea, improving the lubrication at the limbus. At the limbus. Again, this is crucial to, to avoid tube exposures. And again, as Ganesh has mentioned, prevents micro movements. Having a tube snugly fit in a 24 gauge, in a 23 gauge, four millimeter scleral tract, the micro movements are very less. There are no micro aberrations. Also, you have that one potential advantage of avoiding late tube straightening and the tubes getting close to the endothelium. Uh, we have tried to shorten the learning curve as much as possible. Most of our surgeons, just a single uh, session in the wet lab, multiple entries, and we have also multiple entries in the anterior chamber to get this track right. We have also made some uh, calculations on the needle to ensure that the tube lies as close to the iris as possible. See, we have seen, I, I have seen a lot of debates. There's a lot of Photoshop work involved. This was one which Dr. Satyan showed in a recent AIOS ARC debate where you can see the RD implants on Kavita's ears. And uh, probably the first time I didn't have to Photoshop my good friend and colleague, uh, Ganesh, because this is something which we do day in and day out for the last three years. Uh, there is no Photoshop work involved in this. And also the topic is a modified technique saves the time and need for a graft. Uh, Ganesh was saying that I was going to throw a lot of things like prions and uh, uh, COVID at him, but these are all just French benefits. We are just bothered about safety, 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 and then more about safety. And we truly believe that embedding the tube in patients' own sclera is the best way to avoid tube exposures. Uh, the only caveat is to get a scleral tract which is of sufficient length and uh, depth to make sure that the tube is well, well buried in the patient's sclera. And we truly believe this. Uh, we have, uh, even in our pediatric uh, patients, the, the very young, this is the way to go forward to take uh, tube exposures out of the equation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. John. I think both of you have uh, given us all the information which we need in your uh, uh, brief debate. Uh, so I thought I'd we'll just go on to asking some uh, questions uh, rather than countering you all again and again. How would you diagnose and manage a peritubular leak, Dr. George? Ma'am, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a diagnosis of exclusion. The surgeon will have, will on table intraoperatively would have known that there must be something wrong with the track he has. I'm talking about these long spiral tracks. If it is a 23 gauge needle track that has gone into the anterior chamber and has come out and has come out in the same path without slightly extending that track. And uh, there is highly, uh, it's highly improbable to have a peritubular leakage because all modern glaucoma drainage devices, the tubes are designed to fit this 23 gauge needle track uh, snugly. So it's, it's totally a question of uh, uh, exclusion. Uh, we need to look at uh, other factors uh, which would have, uh, which can uh, predispose to ocular hypotony. Can I, can I add a point? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, man. Uh, if you have made multiple attempts, uh, that carries the risk of uh, peritubular leaks. And uh, number two is you can control the point of entry, but very difficult to control the point of uh, exit. So that's another thing in multiple uh, eyes, which have undergone multiple surgeries. So if you have multiple entry sites, you must suture each site separately. And if they happen to go through the same tunnel, suture it very well. So that's the way to avoid. But the diagnosing, as Dr. George said, it is a diagnosis. Dr. Murli, you have any other question before we go on to our next speaker? Murli, you have to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Yeah, can you use autologous uh, sclera or uh, tenons fascia if uh, donor sclera is not available? 
uh, autologous sclera or tenons fascia if donor sclera is not available? Or would you uh, just recommend the needle track uh, technique for? Because many centers may not have uh, donor sclera uh, access to donor sclera. Yeah, I think it's uh, possible. I have not, I have no experience. We always use donor sclera when we started off. Only you could, uh, there are surgeons who use, uh, uh, they make this, they fashion the scleral flap, just like your trabeculectomy flap, they raise the scleral flap and put your tube under that. But again, the ocular surface is raised there. And uh, tenons fascia, I don't think so. Uh, you have to have some, uh, unless you have a good long scleral tract, I don't think you can just leave a tenons fascia alone there. You have to have a sclera attachment. Thank you, Dr. George and Dr. Ganesh. That was a wonderful debate. Uh, we are not able to contact Dr. Suvasini, but I would still want... She's on, to she's I'm, online, there. I'm there, ma'am. Okay, very good. So we shall go on to your debate then. So the next debate section is going to be uh, led by Dr. Suvasini Kaliya Perumal, who's going to be debating that Humphrey visual fields are the best. She's a professor and head of the Department of Ophthalmology, Jipma uh, Pondicherry, and a very eminent surgeon. Let's hear from her. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the topic for the debate is Humphrey visual fields are the best. So it's more important uh, for this presentation. I have no financial interest. Uh, talk about standard white on white perimetry. Humphrey is the name. It remains an invaluable tool for detecting and monitoring visual function laws of glaucoma and it can predict the future risk of functional disability. Why is HFA considered the gold standard for visual field testing? It, because it provides a comprehensive visual field assessment and ensures reliable results. It compares patients' data to age-matched populations. It distinguishes focal from diffuse visual loss, can be used for patients who are wheelchair-bound, hearing-impaired, those with postural and fixation problems, and uh, those with uh, low visual acuity. And most important of it all, it is simple for the examiner to perform and interpret. Uh, there are other white on white perimetry, such as octopus and red Can that you utilize um, other technologies such as SWAP, which is uh, blue on yellow perimetry, frequency doubling, high pass resolution, and flicker perimetry. Among white on white, why HFA scores, it's one of the oldest and time-tested perimeters. There are actually studies comparing HFA versus uh, and octopus. Uh, the sensitivity has found to be almost similar, but HFA has been extensively uh, and uh, well evaluated. Uh, studies exist on HFA. There are long-term data available. And if you see the landmark studies, the early manifest glaucoma trial, the collaborative initial glaucoma trial, and the collaborative normal, uh, normal tension glaucoma uh, treatment study, all of these have incorporated HFA in their uh, visual field analysis. And uh, if you uh, see the popular criteria of Anderson's, the HPA classification of severity of glaucoma are all based on the Humphrey visual fields. And to top it all, it's very user-friendly with the advent of the CETA, uh, CETA strategy. Detection, uh, detecting progression continues to be a challenging task in glaucoma practice and Humphrey sco scores there too. The guided progression analysis or the GPA on the HFA allows trend-based analysis of the global measures such as mean deviation or the visual field index and also the point-wise event-based analysis. Are they fast enough? Yes, the new HFA-3 has a CETA faster strategy which uh, allows the patient to complete the test with, uh, in less than three minutes. If, uh, if you see this picture, the, uh, you can see the evolution of the HFA over the last uh, 50 years. The uh, CETA was introduced in 1997 and you can see the GPA was introduced in 2003. The HFA-3 has a very streamlined and faster workflow with, a, uh, with so many new features with the reduced uh, visual field testing time as you can see in the CETA faster, which is about uh, half the testing time of CETA standard and 70% of the CETA fast, and, but having the same reproducibility as CETA fast. So this improves patient satisfaction and reduces fatigue. The mixed GPA is, uh, uh, allows intermixing of the CETA standard, CETA fast and CETA faster protocols and you get a progression. 
there are other features like the exclusive gaze tracking and the liquid lens uh, technology, which allows uh, uh, to load automatically patients' refractive correction based on the previous exam. Then there is a there is a real eye monitoring, which is a video capture feature that records images images of the patient's eye during the presentation of each stimulus, and it uh, remo- um, and helps to identify unreliable fields. And then there is the kinetic uh, uh, perimetry, uh, which is uh, more uh, extensive in the new uh, HFE three, and uh, there is also the forum uh, glaucoma work. video um, based uh, um, uh, software uh, sorry the it's a uh, medical software by which the clinician can just uh, acquire both the uh, visual field data and the oct data and have it in one place and uh, by this uh, method you can actually uh, even uh, uh, um, what to say uh, you can uh, bring all the data. You can uh, work from a remote computer and get all the. Not only uh, uh, view them, but also you can uh, manipulate the data. And you also have the combined uh, report where there's an integration of uh, structure and uh, uh, function. And uh, this will allow uh, uh, will tell us the anatomical relationship of the visual field points. The visual point. field testing by Headmount and other tablet forms. They are all low low cost methods which will uh, and their portable devices which uh, helps in uh, uh, the screening programs but can they be used as a standalone screening test is a big question the sensitivity and specificity of these tests for glaucoma detection they remain insufficient they are not uh, enough data as of now and uh, uh, so i would like to conclude by telling that hfa uh, at the moment will continue to be the gold standard against which any new technology will be compared thank you uh, Dr. Shalini, could you share your screen? Thank you very much, Dr. Shivasini, for a very extensive uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shalini is a senior consultant, glaucoma in GSVM Medical College, Kanpur, and she's going to tell us why the new. Oh, it's, uh, it's, uh, is way- just, yeah, yeah, Do- Dr. Su- Dr. Subhashini, you need to stop your screen share. Dr. Subhashini, can you stop sharing your screen? I'm not able to share because, yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, sir, I'm just connecting some. Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, AIOS, ARC, and Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy for this opportunity to talk on newer perimeters. Although four minutes is very less for this topic, but still I will try to do justice. As uh, Dr. Subhashti very nicely interpreted the Humphreys perimeter as gold standard device, which we all, like this device, which we all have used and still are having at our armamentarium. But we cannot forget the technology, the evolving technology. And nowadays, when the newer mobile phones are coming up with foldable mobiles, how can we ignore these? So visual field testing is definitely an essential part of glaucoma diagnosis, but is a real challenge because of its subjective nature. Lengthy tests, prolonged duration, and prolonged learning curve. And these are all uh, problems with the Humphreys perimeter. The full threshold is definitely time consuming. And CETA, which is the popular strategy, has found to have poor test retest variability, and particularly in the areas of field loss. And that is why we want a test which is faster, cheaper, easy to use, and relevant to whole population. And that is why we are having newer perimeters, newer programs, and newer algorithms, which actually try to find a trade-off between the testing time and accuracy, and to minimize the patient stress and simultaneously to improve the reliability of results. Now, as Dr. Subhashini said, we have this octopus as white and on white perimeter, which is having the top uh, strategy, which is four times faster than CETA. And in fact, the visual field estimate can be done in just two and a half to three minutes. And therefore, better acceptance, better performance by the patient, frequent frequent examination can be done, and therefore, better detection of progression. Now, when we see the evidence, the comparison between the Humphreys and Octopus has shown that Octopus has shorter test duration and better test reliability also. 
Not only does this, the G1 program in the octopus can identify the central visual field defects which are missed on 24-2 visual fields of CETA program of Humphrey's perimeter. And for that, we need to do 10-2 test several times. Similarly, uh, if we talk of kinetic perimetry, the original Goldman bowl is preserved in octopus, which is somewhat missing in the Humphrey's perimeter. And therefore, extent of visual field examined is better in uh, octopus rather than in Humphrey's perimeter. So there are Indian studies also to prove the same. Now, if we come to other newer perimetry techniques, which actually dissect the visual pathway by targeting specific ganglion cells, and therefore they can detect the glaucoma in early phases where Humphreys usually misses. So uh, we will talk about the frequency doubling technology where we have alternate dark and light bands, and it has been found in this meta-analysis where almost 206 articles were retrieved and they found good sensitivity and specificity with good confidence interval to identify the early glaucometer's defect. Now, when we talk of this blue on yellow perimetry, which is the swap, it has got a value in cases where early visual field defects have been missed. And similarly, if we talk of other perimetry techniques, especially micro perimetry, which has come up, which is the fundus driven perimetry. Now here precise fundus tracking is done throughout the perimetric testing and has got very useful in patients of ARMD, retinitis pigmentosa and Stargard disease. Therefore, every perimeter has its role and we cannot uh, uh, forget the advantages of these perimetric device. When we talk of head mounted perimeter, which is very useful in the patients where we can, we, which are not mobile. Now, this was a very good comparison, which was done between Humphreys and hand mounted perimeter. And they found good correlation with Humphreys perimeter. And not only this, the uh, program, which is 1-2 program, identified the central defects more, uh, uh, more usefully because of the two degrees uh, apart testing strategy used in this perimeter. So the, the debate, the concluding remark, I would say that 20 years ago, when automated perimetry first started, the people, the ophthalmologists used to ask, will it ever replace the conventional perimetry? And now, when we are talking about these newer perimetry techniques, it is the same question which was asked for conventional perimetry. Whether these newer perimeters would replace the current Humphreys? Yes, definitely they have their niche. And we should not forget that our future success is directly proportional to our ability to understand, adopt, and integrate the new technology into our work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shalini. Paucity of time, I'm not going to be asking your questions and we'll come back to you later if you're lucky. So we shall go on to the next interesting segment of this webinar, One Case, One Pearl. And we have a first speaker, Dr. Neha, who's going to be presenting on managing late bleb, uh, uh, leaky blebs, my experience. She's an alumni of RP Center, specializing in pediatric and glaucoma, and has her own glaucoma center at New Delhi, Advanced Eye Care and Glaucoma Services. On to you, Dr. Neha. Thank you so much, Dr. Chitra, Dr. Tanuj, for having me here, and thanks AIOC and ARC. So I'll be talking about managing the late leaky bleb. Second, yeah. So uh, my acknowledgements to my mentor and my colleague, I have no financial disclosures. So in current times, we all know that trabeculectomy is now almost being used along with the adjuvants like mitomycin C or 5FU. So they have definitely increased our success rates. There is no doubt about it. But along with it, it has brought plethora of complications, which includes avascular, localized, thin wall blebs, which show bleb leaks, bleb-related infections. So a perfect balance is required. We need to take care of the mitomycin C factors, like what dose are we using, what duration we are using, a wider area of application. And at the same time, patient factors, like what is our diagnosis? Are we dealing with secondary glaucomas, neovascular glaucomas? What is the target IOP that we are looking at? And how is the overall conjunctival health? Also, the, we know the difference between the incidence of infections becomes higher when the flaps are limbus based and it is lower when it is phonics based. 
So my today's case is a 66-year-old female who uh, was a case of primary angle closure glaucoma and she underwent uh, trabeculectomy approximately 15 years back. And now she presented to us, I'll just start my video. Yeah, so she presented with a thin walled overhanging sedal positive bleb and uh, with complaints of hypotony, uh, complaints of diminution of vision, hypotony. On intraoperative OCT as well as preoperative OCT, we saw that there was a full thickness scleral defect. So using Vana scissors, we excised the uh, dysfunctional bleb tissue and clearly we could see an area of scleral defect. So hemostasis was achieved. And then using a skin biopsy punch, we fashioned a circular scleral graft. And then uh, we used a, a, a crescent knife to make groove in the edges of this graft so that we can tuck in the scleral patch without using sutures. So the scleral patch was tucked in the defect area. So then we again saw it under the uh, OCT and we saw that the defect area was nicely covered. Then a subconjunctival ologen was placed and which was anteriorly covering the thinned out cornea and the scleral patch graft. And since you're falling short of the conjunctiva, we took a conjunctival autograph from the inferior area and then sutured the graft posteriorly to the advanced conjunctiva and anteriorly to the cornea. And uh, at the end of it, we again did the OCT And we saw that the bleb wall as well as the scleral in integrity was very well maintained. So one week post-operatively, patient had uh, IOP of 12 millimeters of mercury. Minute, the repeat ASOCT showed restoration of scleral integrity. So we all know that late onset bleb leaks, there are ways you can uh, you know, manage them non-surgically by use of aqueous suppressants, pressure bandage, tissue adhesives, injection of blood, uh, blood into the bleb, lasers. But however, conservative management for late onset bleb leaks may be uh, helpful in only 50% of the cases and remaining will need some surgery. So the role of ologen is increasingly coming into picture in bleb revision surgeries. Uh, basically because of the following benefits. One being that it provides tamponade over the filtration site in the initial phase and allows help in building up of the IOP. It gives some mechanical support to the thinned out sclera. It prevents conjunctival scarring and failure of your surgery. Cosmetically, it is better than patch graft. It is more readily available. And obviously because it acts as a scaffold for the cells to grow and makes it a good alternative for scleral patch. So as the title is one case, one pearl. So the pearl here is this Dr. Tanuj had already mentioned in his talk that when a patient of late onset bleb leak or hypotony is coming to you, it is very important that you identify the level. Where is the problem occurring? If only conjunctiva is the dysfunctional bleb, epithelium is dysfunctional, conjunctiva is dysfunctional, then you can go for conjunctival advancement only. If your uh, scleral flap is friable, then we can think of raising another scleral flap like Mominy's repair. However, if your scleral bed, the entire scleral bed is necrosed, then you need a scleral patch graft, as in our case. So uh, the use of interior segment OCT and UBM uh, is uh, uh, very helpful. They can help you plan your surgery ahead. So our suggestion is that whenever you have such patients, plan to take them up for interior segment OCT, identify where the problem is, and then have a tailored approach for each case. Thank you. Uh, one question to you, Dr. Tanush. Would you advise that we uh, paint a thin walled bleb whenever we see them in every visit? Uh, can you repeat? You said uh, if you have a thin walled bleb then? Would you paint it and uh, see whether there is a leak at all times in every visit? No, if you have a thin cystic bleb, it is always better to uh, do a sedal test and even apply pressure and see if there is some leakage. And uh, if these patients, you must counsel about the warning signs, what is called as RSVP. If they anytime have redness, sensitivity to light, decreased vision of pain, you 
you should prescribe them a broad spectrum antibiotic they should immediately start using antibiotic and report immediately to the emergency services of any hospital because they are at increased risk for bilbiters and endothelial mitis so i think you require definitely long term surveillance and now we have a low threshold whenever we see a thin cystic overhanging blep the conjunctival advancement procedure is quite simple one and it helps to restore the integrity of the bleb and patient no longer is susceptible to blebitis endothelial mitis so you should go ahead and repair these thin cystic bleb especially if there is a young patient thank you very much though i think the bleb failure is quite imminent when we are doing a conjunctival advancement no yeah that is the side, downside but you have to prevent the uh, vision threatening blebitis endothelial mitis Thank you very much, Dr. Tanush. Our next speaker is Dr. Shanta, who will be talking on managing tube exposure mypearls. She is the deputy director of the Department of Glaucoma in Medical Research Foundation, Chennai, and is an another amazing, prolific personality in the world of glaucoma surgeons. On to you, Dr. Shanta. Would you unmute yourself? Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Shanta. Thank you. I have unmuted myself. So, conjunctival complications include early dehiscence or late erosion, and uh, two to fourteen percent of patients can develop this problem. It places the eye at risk for hypotony, endophthalmitis, poor vision, and thysis, and is more common in the pediatric population. Uh, there are various reasons. It could be mechanical, immune-mediated, or there could be long-term atrophy process resulting in patch thinning and exposure. You could have early exposure or late exposure, as seen here. The late exposure can occur any time after three months to two to three years. Also, the risk factors uh, describe a younger age, inflammation prior to tube exposure, diabetes, inferior quadrant location. increase number of preoperative surgical procedures involving conjunctival dissection black race has also been reported an increased number of pre shunt iop lowering medications previous glaucoma laser procedures and combined procedures with the drainage devices so prevention we have already discussed uh, with the previous speakers you can anchor the tube you can use a steel uh, tunnel and careful conjunctival dissection prior to the surgery and closure as well number of patches uh, can be used to cover the tube uh, the corneal patch has the advantage that it is more cosmetic and in this patient uh, an early conjunctival dehiscence did not matter with the corneal patch because ultimately it epithelialized early management in the early post operative period consists of using either large uh, diameter contact lenses uh, 18 to 20 mm or using doxycycline this patient uh, underwent an inferior tube implant as you can see here 3 weeks later the conjunctiva had necrosed with the exposure of the sclera using doxycycline resulted in healing after about 3 to 4 weeks if uh, conservative management doesn't work especially in late cases uh, the options are surgical treatment uh, common steps for all the techniques include the uh, dissection of the conjunctiva around the area of the exposure undermining it all around and sometimes trimming the edges so that you get a raw surface secure the tube with a sclera and cover the tube with a patch graft of some kind use fibrin glue since uh, uh, the conjunctiva can be uh, scarred and uh, sometimes even necrotic and can cheese fire so apart from using autologous conjunctiva you can use uh, oligen uh, uh, collagen matrix as has been described earlier this was a series in which uh, eight cases had been treated with this technique with good results over a period of uh, 25 months buccal mucous membrane graft has also been described and uh, this can be taken from the lower lip the inner surface the trimmed of the submucosal fat and then used to cover the conjunctival dehiscence human amniotic membrane transplantation has been uh, described as well this was a child with uh, tube exposure 6 months following surgery for glaucoma following uh, congenital cataract uh, surgery and uh, you can see that amniotic membrane transplantation has resulted in a good uh, result so 
Conservative management for early tube exposure, use fibrin glue during the repair to avoid the uh, connectival uh, uh, tearing of uh, the connectival with the sutures. Meticulous attention to technique. Do not make multiple attempts at repair more than twice and most of the time you have to remove the implant and remove implant if the plate is exposed. If the plate is exposed, covering it with a patch craft does not work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shanda. Wonderful talk. Murli, you have a question to ask before we go on to our next speaker. Just one question, fast. Okay. Uh, madam, uh, is there any role for a tasso conjunctival uh, flap uh, in these cases of tube or implant exposure? There was an isolated case report where an implant which was exposed was salvaged by a, a tasso conjunctival rotational graft. So, yeah, uh, I think uh, that's not required most of the time. All the, the techniques that I have described suffice. Maybe if there's severe ocular surface disorder where these kind of techniques will not work, then that uh, splitting of the tarsal lid plate can be tried. Thank you very much, Dr. Shanta. Our next speaker is our dynamic leader, Dr. Vijaya, who will be discussing a very challenging situation, managing high intraocular pressure that is refractory to most measures. On to you, Doctor. Uh, uh, thank you, Chitra. Um, I, I think uh, since uh, this is uh, one case and how I managed and what is the pearl. I just stick on to my presentation. This is a difficult case which I managed, Ella Dana syndrome. A 22 year old female uh, who lost one eye because of the injury was referred to as for further management because her pressure was not getting controlled well with the maximum therapy in the right eye. She is a known case of Ella Dana since 20 years with a PDA closure and subiotic membrane dissection. No significant family history. And presentation, uh, she, if you look at it, it is a minus 20. Most of the enlargement is related to the posterior segment because of the scleral thinning. The anti-segment on the contrary was not very deep. It was lesser than the normal anti-chamber depth. Pressure was not controlled and there was equatorial stepheloma and gonoscopically had open angles. And this is the Optos pictures that shows you significant glaucomatous cupping with the myopic uh, degeneration, which is a pathological myopia. Had advanced visual field loss. So single eyed girl and uh, has equatorial staphyloma, not amenable for the, uh, either with the trabeculectomy or to the ciliary ablation. So what, what can we do? So it is a LR Dallas opening up and trying to do any other surgery also is difficult. So after discussing in, in detail, and we decided to do it in AGV and general anesthesia. General anesthesia was chosen because of the difficulty, difficulty in this uh, case to be managed and also because of the high myopia and the LR Dallas. So we have decided to, to choose the inferior nasal site because that was not as badly as affected with the rest of the areas and decided to use the fibrin glue and to the close the patch graft and also to the large extent the conjunctiva to minimize the chances of the scleral bites you will be taking with the conventional uh, AGV implant. This is a, a brief video and you can see the extent of the staphyloma all around which I have shown. This is the inferior nasal quadrant as I mentioned to you, she had a very shallow antechamber. Remember that some of the steps what I'm doing is difficulties are mainly because of the shallow antechamber. We were able to fix the plate eight millimeters from the limbus. These are the only two bites I have taken and to fix the plate with the 91 island. Used high magnification, carefully taken that bites to avoid any kind of a perforation and measured the tube and the trimmed the tube in the usual way where the tip will, the bevel will be facing up. I tend to insert, enter two millimeters, one, one minute minute. to two millimeters from the limbus, but you can see here, I have difficulty in entering because of the shallow anterior chamber. So in view of that, I tried to see whether I can reposition. I couldn't, so I have, I have to enter again at the limbus. Again, inserted the tube. Again, the tube is getting blocked with the iris because of the fairly shallow antechamber. 
So what I did was I took out the tube and kind of a, a, a de-roofed the tip. So created a, like a, a tunnel. Initially, I tried shortening it, but even that is not helping me. So finally, I decided I kind of de-roofed almost for 1.5 millimeters of the uh, tube, 1 to 1.5 millimeters of the tube. So even if the tip is getting blocked with the iris, I know very well the aqueous can still go through this tube. So in the standard fashion, I have put the uh, um, cardia, use the fibrin glue as I mentioned, and uh, used a close the kanjing taiva because of the short lack of time. I think I have to move on to the next slide. So next day when we saw her, she had a flat anti chamber and the pressure was high. So to examine the posterior segment, I dilated patient, gave her two tablets of Dimox. Immediately with the dilatation, AC has deepened. So we kept uh, her an atropine and dorazolamide and timolol and continued with the antibiotics and steroids. Next day, this is the Optos picture. You can see hemorrhagic choroidals in spite of all the precautions we have taken. So we treated with the uh, tablet uh, Visalon systemically, topical uh, steroids and atropine and continued with the dorazolamide and timolol. She responded well to the treatment. You can see on the sixth post of day with her glasses, vision was 636 and 6, IOP of 12 millimeters. We tapered the steroids. You can see the tube is functioning even though the tip is to be still tucked in the iris. So in a refractory glaucoma where the trabeculectomy is not feasible, even, the, even a diode is not feasible. So we managed to do the AGV implant at a site where there was minimal uh, staphylomas there and use the fibrin glue uh, to avoid multiple bites through the sclera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vijay. That was a wonderful uh, case which you shared with us and so much of learning. Murli, could you ask one question before we go on to our last speaker? It's truly uh, nice. Yes, madam. Thank you, uh, madam. Uh, madam, what options do we have if this AGV implant fails in this uh, patient? <laughs> Uh, you, being a fakey kind, being a uh, highly um, biopic fundus, even to do endoscopy is not going to be easy. So we ha I'm just praying and hoping that it will work for a longer period of time. I really don't have any option. <laughs> yeah. we, Murli, we referred this patient to Dr. Vijaya, uh, <laughs> thinking, that, <laughs> thinking that she will do an endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, but I think they are so happy that... Uh, Something, uh, something that is better has been done. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it will work for her. Thank you. So we shall go on to our last but not the least, Dr. Manju Pillai, another pillar of the Lokma Department of Arvind Eye Care Systems, Madurai. And she is going to dwell on a very difficult situation, a difficult book talmus. On to you, doctor. Could you unmute? Can you hear me now, ma'am? Yeah. Okay, uh, so it's the last presentation. Uh, so here I'm just presenting a small case series. What signal is poor? The next slide. So it's a siblings uh, of case series, like a two month old male child presented with left eye watering and born to non cantangulous parents, and just a full term cesarean session with a uh, normal antenatal and neonatal uh, history. And on clinical examination at two months of age, there was a megalocornea in the right eye 
and cataract in both eyes and intraocular pressure was 11 in the right eye and 22 in the left eye and right eye had an axial length of 18 and left eye was 90.49. So we diagnosed as a bilateral congenital cataract with glaucoma and started a treatment with anti-glaucoma medication of topical dosolamide and scheduled an examination under anesthesia. But the child was lost to follow up due to COVID-19 and lockdown restrictions and the, he was poor, there was a poor compliance to medication. And came for review after six months, that was at eight months of age, where they had not used the medication, the pressure shot up to 41 millimeters of mercury and actually increased to 20.16. And the cataract was dense, and this was the picture in the left side. So on systemic examination, there was a delayed milestones, and CNS noted a hypertony with a global developmental delay. When we took the family history, we also noted that the brother had some eye problem, and he had undergone treatment in both the eyes and he lost vision in the right side. So we called the parents for an examination and checked his case sheet and he also defect, uh, had a defective vision at 15 months of age and the similar uh, history, no uh, delayed milestones. And both a, there was a record of classical cataract surgery done and was on anti clock communication. And top screening was positive for the brother that was an IgG gene for CMB and fraction lardy in the right eye and left eye showed an RP mode link and ERG showed a reduced roads and con amplitude. So an examination of the elder brother showed that the right eye was aphetic and left eye was aphetic with a normal disc and intraocular pressure was borderline with 24 and the natural length was stable. And this is a picture of the elder brother. So for the baby, we did the investigations. All the basic investigations were normal, and the top screening showed a high positivity for CMB IgG. And examination of the parents, mother showed a posterior polar cataract in the left side. And so the common features in both the siblings were congenital cataract, glaucoma, delayed milestones, and IgG CMB positive. So now, what was the etiology and diagnosis for these children? Which I to operate first? Uh, whether to do a glaucoma surgery first or the cataract surgery. So E of the second sibling showed under anesthesia the ten pressures were 33 in the left eye was all enlarged and axial length was 90 and right eye had a dense cataract in the vision axis. So we restarted the AGM case combination and when I did the right eye cataract extraction and two weeks later I underwent a left eye RC surgery. So this is a picture first was as a cataract and this is after the cataract extraction, and this is after RD where the cornea has cleared up. Now we are going to be taking it from for the left eye cataract extraction. So here the challenges were diagnosis, treatment of glaucoma and persistent cataract, and the investigations that we need to do. So diagnosis, whether it's a congenital infection, and if it's a congenital infection, we got CMV as uh, when we were checking, and the Sushuda Kaushik article shows it has a rubella and a con con concomitant rubella and a CMV infection for a child with a glaucoma and cataract. And then the CMV mega infection, like a virus infection in Dracula measure, and, and another one with a congenital CMV with glaucoma. This is a little rarer. And the incidence of congenital infection increases in the first is 90% in the first 11 weeks, and it's 100% in the 11, uh, last month of pregnancy. And rate of congenital defects is more in the first 11 weeks of gestation. And pathogenesis of glaucoma and congenital infections is causes abnormal development of ankle, secondary to either secondary, secondary to cataract, or, or following cataract extraction. CMV infection is the most common interaction infection, but it causes cataract rarely. And it mainly affects the coronary. So if it's an inherited disorder, then there are two diagnoses that we can make. One is the Lewy syndrome, or second one is the Nansoran syndrome. Nansoran syndrome, we need to look at the dentition. And Lewy syndrome, it has congenital cataract and glaucoma, and females act as carriers, and we need to do an investigation. So the take home message is a proper family history, history taking, screening of parents and siblings are essential, differential diagnosis and appropriate investigation needs to be done. And treatment plan needs to be set you well for treating coexisting cataract and glaucoma to preserve the child's vision and to treat glaucoma protection. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manju. Uh, Dr. Shushmita, are you there? Hello? Hello, yeah. 
Yeah, doctor, I because there was a lack of clarity, so I wasn't sure whether Dr. Manju could hear my uh, question. How early would you implant tube in these cases when the need arises? And the second question is, would you do a look at a 360-degree trabeculectomy or versus harms? So, um, a 360-degree trabeculotomy, apparently those who are doing it, especially with the eye science now, um, at least in more fields, they have reported no failures at all. So, intuitively, I would think that a 360, if we can do it, maybe a GAT, as uh, <clears throat> uh, Rashmi was saying, uh, the initial uh, trials at GAT haven't been very successful. I've, I've managed about 180, but uh, not 360 as yet. But... Uh, the more angle you treat, the more likely it is to get uh, better. So definitely, if we can get hold of it, a 360 would be more. Um, regarding tubes, as, as we all grow over the years, the enthusiasm for invasiveness decreases and conservativeness increases. And uh, 10 years ago, I would have been all gung-ho about putting the tube anywhere, but... Uh, you realize that with children uh, with a growing eye, there are problems of uh, tube migrations, of movement, of rubbing, and the cornea generally does uh, take a toll on it. So I would be very conservative in putting tubes in small babies, unless absolutely. And in fact, limited diode laser cyclophotocoagulation is much lesser invasive for the children. You do, we do about 180 degrees or even less, 150 degrees <clears throat> in the failed uh, cases, of course. I mean, you. so we start off in a white cornea. I would start off with a combined trap with trap. And many times the cornea clears, but the pressures are not good enough. So we do uh, goniotomy in the second because you have the rest of the angle. And in many, many cases, that's enough. We can go on to even a third goniotomy at times. So if you have a 360, that will help. But tubes are, I would be more... Uh, comfortable doing them in secondary glaucomas where I know the other eye is completely normal, especially if they are pseudo picking. There it's it's okay. But for primary tubes, I am a little hesitant now. I think Dr. Vijay is smiling because <laughs> she's she's seen us grow and then talk the same thing that ma'am used to tell us and and now we've all realized that how true that was. So, so any other questions from the expert panel? Dr. Vijaya, Dr. Tanoj, Dr. Craig, it's sorry that uh, we couldn't uh, take some more questions with you. Thank you very much for having been with us till the end of the event. Dr. Vijaya? Yeah, nothing specific. I think uh, quite late for everyone. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope it was. Yeah, I think uh, it's quite late. So I'll uh, give my uh, conclusive marks. It's been a very truly an amazing webinar because there was a wide gamut of topics so beautifully discussed. And I think we owe it to all of you, all prolific surgeons and teachers in this uh, group for making it so special. Uh, special thanks to my co-moderator, Dr. Murli, for his uh, constant support all through. My thanks to my special ARC team. Thanks to our admit team of AOS led by Mr. Kripal. Of course, Mr. Sunil, who's the webinar admin, who has been associated with all of us throughout this uh, early part of the uh, planning and uh, course of the webinar. Sai and Manjula from Numerotech and a very special thanks to the Entoad team led by Mr. Nikhil who have been our uh, main sponsors for every single ERC program this far. Our thanks to our very special thanks to our attendees who gave us the energy to keep coming back again and again with more useful webinars. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much one and all of you in this uh, very expert panel and speakers. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Chitra. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Chitra. Thank you. Get vaccinated. As yes. The most person in the group I'm advising. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, I got